think we're ready to go, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, it's taken a bit of time to organise in a different room and get the technology to work a bit. Thanks for bearing with us. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, no emergency drills are planned today. In the event of a fire or other emergency, you vacate the building in an orderly manner with an accidental exit, which on to the left. Um, and Clear. Recording of the meeting. Please may ask live stream is starting and verbal confirmation provided when we are broadcasting. I can confirm, Chairman, the live streaming has now been started. Thank you very much indeed. So, welcome to the meeting of the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Committee. Digital papers and other relevant information for the meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. And also making a recording. The recording will be available via the council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are permitted to film, photograph, and record our public meeting, providing it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourself so anyone intends to record the meeting can be made aware. Would anybody like two people identify themselves? Thank you. And just finally, to ensure that recording quality is maintained, could members He looks like he's on the line. Still on his screen now. Victor, can you hear? And looks like you're it's, on mute. Um, unmute and say you can. Good afternoon. It is. Okay. It is. Good afternoon. It is going in and out quite a bit. I'm sorry. So the picture and the and the uh, the conversation. Ah, Victor, right. We can just about hear you on this PC, Victor, but we can't hear you publicly. Uh, I'm not on you, no, uh, but I can't seem to... Uh... You can't remove your mute, but we can hear you. Sorry, I sound like I'm, I've got this terrible echo. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I can hear, I can hear, hear part of the meeting, and I can see part of the uh, uh, part of the action. Call it that. We can now hear you, but there's echo. I'll log off and try again. Oh, oh. is technical. We can see you. Frozen. So, Chair, it's similar for me. It's fading in and out. I may also try and log back in. Can you hear me? Can we see if we can get organised for those two? Sorry, can we see if we can get those two? We need to move on. We'll try and get. 
Helen and Victor are online to see if you can join us, but we'll carry on since there's stuff we can get through before you come to speak. So present in the room today, as well as members of the committee, Chris Roadwine, who's chair of the board. See you. We have uh, Council Literature, the, the um, leader, Council Tonbury, the member, cabinet member for Children's Services, Carl uh, Hancock. From here, what we can hear so is the noise down the corridor. Room. We have Julie, Julie Pepper, who is head of service. I think I've confirmed that correct. Nobody else feels I've missed. Okay, thank you. And of course, Daryl. Sorry, Daryl. How could I forget? The, the corporate director of children and young people. Co optees, we have Sam Prattley, Diocese of Pettiford, and the Fiona Reeves Army is co optee. Uh, as we've seen, we can't get the two who are online yet. We've got Michael Carr, who is the statutory scrutiny officer, Simon Khan, who is the democratic services officer at our clerk, and Alfie Reese Guinness, who are levels before that, of course, John Coleman, democratic services. Do you have any comments? Andy James and Councillor Graham Andrews. But we are Mr. who is acting as a substitute. That's for okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that's the main substitute. Oh. Any apologies anyone knows of that I should be given that I missed? Okay. Declarations of interest. That they might be having any items on the agenda. Do any members of the committee have any declarations of interest? Okay, we move on then to the minutes of the last meeting. Sign and approve the minutes of the meeting held on the left. Someone have to approve that we accept them. Approve and, approve and second, then we will have any points to raise. No questions on the what was, had been minuted, whether things had happened. But that's not part of the minutes, is it? So you have some points we want to yeah. raise later on or now? I, I don't mind when, when now, is the think, uh, okay. um, It says HR organization development team had recently overseen the delivery of a counter wide staff survey, the findings of which are were due to be disseminated immediately, imminently. Have we seen them? And also details of staff employed in interim roles or on long-term sickness, stroke absence, and how staff are being supported and how staff are being supported for work. Have we had notification of this? Thank you. You got them that there's no obviously that's as you sign them if you haven't got them. And I'd like to add under corporate responsibility a paragraph which was um, on asking for information about the payments that have been made, it drives some head of the law to the committee for full information. And all the legal payments have been made, excluding personal information, but still these are the number of payments the amount of each and if it how many other non HR cases have been similarly settled and paid. Views should be a public domain, and we did check that that was included everybody, and it was. So we'd like that added. I can give you the text for that later. Uh, yeah, Chair, is, is there all of the supplementary questions asked by members of the public in these minutes? Because I can't find them. It's in the appendices. I'm sure of that. Published. Google we'll check. Is that the one in the meeting itself? Yes, they, they should all be part of the, the public record. Let me just check for you. Yeah. I should just come. The, the reason for the query is that obviously a clerk left the minutes and it's taken a while to find replacement. Again. Apologies, we were really catching up on all that <coughs> just this week. But we will do. Chair, um, Chair, can I make a point on that? Can I make a, um, on the minutes, yes. Well, on the whether or not the 
there is the supplementary questions are on the website. Um, I checked last night and there is only one response to the supplementary questions, and that is for my own question. The supplementary questions that were asked, that, apart from myself, I think. <coughs> You both raised that. I think, I think the people are not. That was that was the case. Did you want to raise uh, a point about that? Which my, was my supplementary question is this. Okay. Right. So we need to know. We need to double check on all the supplementaries and make sure they're included. Yeah. Just, just confirm the res the response to my supplementary question is on the website of this meeting. It is on the website or the meeting it relates to. Okay. The 11th of October. Somebody else is going to comment on supplementary questions? No? Uh, can well, I comment it's on... Still on the minutes of supplementary questions? Yes. Uh, well, it is on the matter of, of unanswered questions. Can I well, if it was supplementary questions, <clears throat> which is the question we're raising, the word they published, is it on the supplementary? It's on. It's related to that matter of questions not being answered. You're going to get some questions later, aren't you? Can we yeah, raise well, that? I'll, I'll, and your questions have been properly posted. Could we have a proposal that we accept the minutes, please? Um, can you give a second there? Councillor Fagan, all those in favour, that can vote. Thank you. Anyone against? Any other questions? Sustainability of agency workers was not responded. To, yet is a valid concern raised and could be in stark contrast to where there is a mid to long term social services intervention. It is obviously commendable having a low number. However, if this is due to a precautionary investigation, the evidence has no merit for continued support and is closed. It skews the other numbers if included for those needing more support, which is where the families feel at report feeling frustrated. Please can the committee look and report the range of allocated social work numbers broken down to show the time scale of involvement um, via a range, and if also possible, to include the number of agency staff compared to permanent staff allocated per item in the range to again see how the reliance on agency staff affects relationships with children and families. Thank you. There's always a lot to answer there. I don't know if we can give an immediate response to any of that, or probably question I think is analysis probably going to be required to I think it is I think you're you're asking the committee as well aren't you to, to see that data rather than necessarily for me to respond I think that's the, the committee is for the committee to I, 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 I think I think I think you raised a very valid point though in terms of uh, how we can better represent the range rather than just the average because I think it's a different story in there sometimes so I, I, I'm tired I, I appreciate your question that's okay um I'm also due to answer a supplementary question on behalf of 
yeah. Terry Fenner. And um, although yeah. Ra Rachel has nominated me, um, I haven't received the email prior to coming in here today. So I'm either happy to read it or happy for you to take the opportunity to read it as you have it, have you. hopefully, personally to hand. You um, have to and the one for Theresa Fenner first. So if you're happy for me to do the, the yeah. 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 just complete the first chapter to six later yes. and that we think it will be useful for individual life stories to illustrate individual life stories because when you get the mean you get an understanding to be useful to the next that just confirms what we agreed with yeah, that yeah I, I, I think the range is going to be really important if you're going to get 13 to 20 social workers which is what i have verbal representations of then that mm -hmm. And if you look at that over a 12 month period, which is for some of them, that's shocking. You work out the average time that social worker had any involvement in that child and with that family. You can't you know, at all. We want to see those numbers going down. So the point's been made, and we will make sure we get that. Yep. Question back to you, Hannah. Okay. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you. Well, Sorry. You're going to ask the <laughs> supplementary for Theresa Fenner. I am. Um, Theresa has kindly put um, please, can this scrutiny committee? look at what is being done to improve the working condition for our county's foster carers. As a former foster carer for many years, having been forced out because of a less than acceptable dishonesty of reports made about me, I worry that children's services are struggling to recruit the best of people to this very wonderful but stressful profession without hope of, uh, without huge improvements to the support given. If we do not have enough foster carers, then it is inevitable that the very damaging policy of adoption, seemingly being seen as practice, will continue leaving our struggling families broken and desperate. Please, can you, uh, please, are you looking at early help too as a scenario of concerns and inadequacy? I've always read the first question by mistake. <laughs> looking at the faces around the door. <laughs> no, that's right, that's right. I'm sorry, it's on the record. I'm happy, I'm happy yeah. to be a human. And I was getting the emails late last night and early this no, morning because obviously no, we only got notified no, quite late. It's quite new over and gave me an asking the question as well. So. so, sorry, correct the question. I would like to hear that other foster carers, past and present, can give their points of view and be consulted on what should be improved. For us, it would be that the promises of support and respite be given and that reports are truthful and accurate. No point in recruitment if the system use excuses for bad practices. As for early help, ask the parents what would benefit them and their families and stop haranguing help. I know we're setting up forums to improve the quality of the if I, if I comment, thank you for the question again. Um, so if I comment on the foster care point for a start uh, that you raised on behalf of the family. So there's a lot of work going on at the minute with our current foster carers. Um, but um, the point you're asking, the, well, one of the points you're raising is also how might previous foster carers engage with this? And I would say if there are any previous former foster carers to speak with me personally, I'm very happy for them to contact me or uh, Ruby and Khan, who's the head of service for fostering, because there's quite a big piece of work going on at the minute to review support in place for foster carers. And I agree entirely with the questioner's point. Foster carers are an incredibly uh, valuable resource, uh, and they do an amazing job for some of our children care, and we have to want to recruit and support. Virtual person, virtual person. In person for these foster carers to attend. I've, I've recently met two former uh, two former foster carers. So as I said, if former foster carers want to have a conversation with myself or the head of service for fostering, you just need to contact them. Certainly. Uh, um, yeah. um, in terms of early help, that's um, so early help provision of early help services isn't the primary responsibility of children's social care services. Uh, it should be the it should be the responsibility of a and obviously some of the activities we've been doing recently with um, the World Cafes uh, and the work through Talk Community, it's been to try to further develop the range of early health services that are in place for families. Our intention and our goal to be that we but not only extend the what's available, but also we create more opportunities for families just to be able to see 
reach out to support directly straight onto, for example, a website or contact the early help head helpline, which will be open again from January. So they have to come to children's social care services. That's all. So where where families want to access that early help, and that's what that's what we're doing at the moment. So we've had a lot of feedback from families about how we do that. I think, um, and particularly that that's right, they valued the early help um, helpline. It was previously in place, that's why we restarted it in January. Okay, well, obviously, that's captured. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm not sure if Jenny had something she wanted to mention yeah, to me or whether the impediment. So you uh, had to get the threshold right before you went yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and, um, we, and we believe we're in that position, and we can absolutely open so that up again. Your threshold. Yeah. That's great. Well, it's supplementary to your supplementary. It is, and I, I mean, it's, it's also is a shame that there wasn't something like that, even if it didn't tick all the boxes during COVID, that would have been <coughs> really easily rectified and resurrected mm -hmm. to have supported families during a really difficult time, mm -hmm. where we have been vastly criticised by children's services for not being able to achieve the outcomes that were expected of us during that time when the services and universal services that we were being expected to achieve weren't available to us, resulting sadly in permanent removal of children. Um, I'm happily, I will happily supply that to you, but okay. yeah, just thank you. These important. additional points, technically, we're just here to listen to questions, but I'm aware yeah. of the sensitivity these issues are for many of you, so allow a few extra moments to comment. I'm willing to allow that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think so. Rachel Gallagher's question, which you're not going to read out, Hannah, but you'd like me to read out. I, I don't have a copy of it, so okay. if you've got it and you're happy to I do it, I, as long as it's on the record, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. It says. <laughs> How is being permanently separated from a sibling never in the best interest of any child? Put yourselves in our shoes. Would you support your own children being separated? Of the 10 placement orders made in 2021, how many were made with the consent of the parents? And all the placement orders from 21, 22 so far have been made with the consent of the parents. I presume we need to go back and check that. Yeah, the data question there. And, and uh, placement orders are, are made by the court, not necessarily with the consent of, of the parents, but I'm happy to get the data. You get an answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Fiona Ray to Loretta from me. The response to your original question mentioned views and opinions of families expressed at recent over meetings. However, I know of only one meeting, which is on 20th of October 2022 and organised by the support group for birth families called A Common Bond. Some councils attended, but I understand no officers, although at least two were invited. ACB could have been invited to collaborate with the draft improvement plan and could collaborate, collaborate in future. Both parents and their children are main youth service users of children's services. I hope the forum for families will mainly be represented by them. There should be representatives from parents whose children are or were involved in different ways, e.g. looked after children. I hope you will listen, address feedback, and take appropriate action, that's a quote, collaborate, which is a quote, with families at pace. When will the first meeting of the forum actually happen? 
So first of all, I agree entirely with Ms. Reid um, that um, that we a need to actually part of the, the um, plan that I'm driving forward is that we must listen to families more going forward. We're hopeful that uh, our a draft proposal for um, the listening to families approach will be available in January that we will share with certainly known and recognised representative groups uh, and uh, myself as a member of this committee uh, and then we'll get that group of uh, organisations and representatives together as early as possible, certainly before Easter and I would hope by the end of February. I'm going to ask you about a time scale, so that's the time scale we're working to. Now, I understand there might be another secretary from uh, Melissa. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Barrett. Are you here? Are you answering a separate supplementary or on behalf of? Why should we do? Yeah, come out here, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry. I was just making you go on your own mind. So you want me to read my question supplement? Yes, yeah. uh, whilst there seems to have been a lot of hard work in the past three months to compose a plan to demonstrate changes can be delivered at pace. My experience as a parent is little has changed in practice. If changes have been made, as suggested by the director of the family, do I feel threatened by social workers and live in fear of the removal of our children? Why in a role of corporate parent do you feel it is anyone's, let alone a minor's, best interest not to be allowed fresh air or attend the hospital chapel, chapel on religious grounds and to leave a hospital ward? Sorry, I can't hear you. For my daughter to get fresh air, however, your frontline staff and even the CEO of Herefordshire Council we're not. This went against my child's basic human rights and my rights as a legal parent guardian. I have very recently been told verbally that fostering procedures against my child. However, please advise how many families have been consulted to see if any of the measures put in place over the last few months have been recognised by them. If such consultation has been based. Do you agree it is unreasonable to suggest changes made or effective for the families? So thank you for the question. And I'm sorry that that's your experience. And I, what, what we don't do here, and I won't do, is discuss or respond to your individual family circumstances. But I'm happy to meet with you, Mr. Barrett, if you'd like to have a conversation about that. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, consultation. One of the things we, we have acknowledged in the plan is that our ability to engage agent consumers providing that um, um, listening to families approach, which I've answered in the last question in terms of getting that out in January and early February. Um, and uh, one of the measures that we will absolutely want to use as the DfE Improvement Advisor and Eleanor Brazil want to see as well is to see that not only in terms of what we're for, what we're reporting and performance. We're also checking that against unemployment insurance audits and the complaints uh, and engagement. So you recognise there's not been enough of that in the past, and absolutely committed to sure we do a lot more of that next year. Uh, I'll repeat, I'm happy to yeah, okay. your, your circumstances. Uh, yeah, can I just ask what sort of time you can attend to these matters from Mr. Barrett? Could you, what, what sort of time frame can you give for him to have his meeting with you, please? Uh, well, if Mr. Barrett's, um, I've been sorry, uh, asked to meet, they refused to meet me, uh, for because this is the pro the issue I'm having, and you're having with me is six years historically of what's been happening to my family for a rest refused the meeting with me. And uh, they said that we're not dealing with complaints over a year past, but I explained that the complaint wasn't dealt with properly and effectively anyway. I've got all this email. Sounds familiar. Um, because I was lied to. I was told they cannot deal with my complaint because the social worker, and I will say the name here, James, had no longer worked for her. That was 
So late night, she carried on working 18 months after I made my initial complaint. So what I'd suggest is that can we refer to the independent investigator for Mr. Barrett? Uh, so I haven't refused to meet um, you in the past, and I've and I've said I'm very happy to meet with you. So I'll happily set that up if you if you stay here till the end of the meeting. We'll set that up. But if you're shooting off after your question, I will contact you after. I was going to ask you the same. I think you've got an answer to this. Yeah. As we're present, you'll be, you'll be having a meeting organised. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that commitment direct on the DCS. Yeah. Okay. It's been <laughs> Thank you. All the full supplementary time. Somebody else would like to ask one, and you don't want to be filmed. So, can we move the camera around, please? Sorry, sorry. Again, an independent investigator. Well, it shows not to directly lead with, with face of faith and confidence in you as an, an authority. Can you explain how we might be able to access this independent person, please? So the first step in, in that conversation will be to uh, have a conversation to understand what might need to be investigated. I've, I've offered to meet Mr. Barrett and then... in all three ways to the council and we have Bill Wiggins representative sitting in the room here and between us we're aware of only one family who has been contacted by the external reviewer um, and that is Angeline who in order to get to the external reviewer had to go through the trauma of the panorama program so I'm afraid the parents do not believe that the external examiner is looking at any other cases. And I'd just like to hear whether we are wrong. Thank you for your question. Now, I guess. And I'm talking about whether they are actively looking at it now, not what the future plans are, but whether we're actively looking at it. Well, I can't speak on behalf of the independent viewer, so I don't know what status she's at with individual cases. So. Oh, okay. So you think that more than one person is being dealt with by the ex-review? I know that more than one family, I'm not going to talk about individuals, I know that more than one family has been raised with the independent reviewer. But that's different from whether the reviewer has done anything in contact with his family. I know, I'm not able to answer the question, I'm afraid. So Can we ask that question of the reviewer? Who, who manages the, the, this investigator? To know from your point of view, you're making such public declarations, as was in the full council meeting, that this no, is happening. You, 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 you reported on it, so therefore somebody has that responsibility. There would be a question, and we know that there is a question to be asked. We don't, we can't answer ourselves, but we can go back and ask. We can. Yes. The, the problem is, it just feels like more of the same old spin. Well, let's see what the answer is, and we will, as a scrutiny committee, you look at that and see if we feel yeah. we've had a better or whether we need to raise it again. Yeah. Can I just add to what um, the previous question? People do not want, want to.
and, and you need to recognise the trauma that's already been caused and make up a very much. Do actually do recognise that people are traumatised by some of their questions. One other supplementary, I think, you'll see you want to become a of supplementary. <laughs> Unfortunately, my question wasn't actually submitted in its whole entirety. If you did make that point. Yes. If you yes. Did, if you asked to tell him when you found the whole question. I've got the whole question with me. So we can get the original whole question out so that there's clarity for everybody in the room. Then I can put my supplementary okay. question in, if, if you're okay, sir. Yep. Thank you very much. So the question is about section 10 of the draft improvement plan for children. Mm -hmm. We refer to as SEND. The contents of the draft improvement plan focus heavily on improving processes and paperwork. Children and outcomes for children barely feature. There is nothing about listening to, working in part or supporting carers, a critical part of the improving outcomes to children with SEND. The plan is focused on the timely production and complete work. There is scant reference to the quality assurance process and implementation reviews. The families of a and their SEND children needs are still not being met. Cultural change is badly and urgently needed. Is leadership. This was answered, and this is my supplementary question in that. In my personal experience, SEND children and young people are still poorly understood, and parents of SEND children are still missing out on vital education basic needs remain unmet raise the alarm many times through many mediums, the pattern is still delay, denial of need. How do you intend to achieve cultural change and how do you intend to measure this in the time map and with a time scale? Thank you. That's quite a challenging So you're, you're absolutely right. Will you put that in writing to me? You're sorry, that's been my experience. Of course. I will see that in writing because obviously Paul Walker said publicly and in the papers that he personally, I have no intentions of doing that personally. My experience I'm talking okay. about on there. I would like to see that obviously you know the current situation. Because I have asked for meetings and I have been denied them. Darren was giving you that assurance and apology. Darryl, and, and in relation to the um, the SEND section of the improvement plan, the improvement plan in, in the format that it's got to be submitted to offset later this month is, is very high level. Behind each of those sections is a lot more detail uh, that aren't in, in that that's, that's happening um, at the moment is there's a, a, a with the SEND partnership, which includes Parent Care Voice as one of the key partners there, um, uh, to develop an SEND strategy, which will be published early in the new year, um, and uh, that brings together a new strategic group, so the partners with health, um, uh, education, uh, and um, carers. And that's partly due to the feedback review that we commissioned in October. Uh, uh, so, and also reflects some of the changes to the um, Green paper and that's going to so you need to do that work, and I can't answer the question. It deserves more of an answer than I can give you in a couple of minutes. Um, I'd be very happy, I think we've got it on the agenda early in the new year anyway, but to provide a more full update in terms of some of the detail behind that SEND work stream. Is the peer review public then? Um, uh, it's been shared with all the partner agencies. Um, I'm very happy to publish the slide. Excuse me.
Oh, nice. Being inclusive, so, yeah, or, or some sort of online survey for people Thank to you. go outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's the end of the supplementary questions. Thanks very much, to members of the public, for coming. I think you'll realise that we've been pushed to say we, we need to move on constitutionally, but I, we are very aware of the scrutiny, and indeed the council that children's service and indeed adult often the questions of the people who have been traumatised and the very sensitive issues. So. I'm sure you feel you've had a fair opportunity to express your thoughts and ask the questions I've been listened to. We've allowed more, a bit more flexibility to them. Thanks. Technically, we should, but I hope you feel that's been helpful. It's been very Thank nice very not to be constantly interrupted whilst being spoken to as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, and we'll now move on to the rest of the business. Thank you. Which is now moving on to the reports. And I've got three reports we're looking at this afternoon. And the first one is corporate parenting, and this is to consider the council's corporate parenting strategy report that's been uh, published and is available for you to look at. And uh, now I thought Rachel might be coming to introduce the uh, uh, Rachel sends apologies, she's not well. Uh, Bruce, so will you be doing that then? I'll, I'll briefly introduce it and I'll hand over to Julie, um, but we'll assume the page. Care leavers. Um, the strategy itself, in terms of our published strategy, is an older one. Uh, it's due to expire at the end of next year. We're bringing, we have brought forward the review, so we'll be bringing uh, a revised version of that strategy to the corporate parenting board in January. Uh, and I assume that, uh, that um, scrutiny committee will want to look at it at some point after that as well. Um, so um, progress is reported against each of the seven current priorities. They're not necessarily reflective of what we anticipate. Our priorities to be next year. I'll ask Julie just to kind of draw out a couple of headlines, but otherwise uh, go straight into questions. Yeah, yeah. You say thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, as Daryl's just said, we um, my task over Christmas is to refresh and, and revise the strategy, and that will be at Corporate Parenting Board in January, um, along with another a, a couple of other documents in terms of the local offer for our care leaders and our financial policy, and also our participation and engagement policy, because all they all they all join together and clearly, you know, the improvement plan drives everything that is being written currently. So as Daryl just said, a lot of this work is under is sits underneath the, the improvement strategy. Um, voice is very uh, pertinent and critical right now. It was mentioned in the LGA report. So we are the participation and engagement strategy will address that. We are currently well, we're out to recruitment for a participation and engagement team manager in the new year. I'm revising that strategy. We are looking at how we refresh and revise our Children in Care Council and our Care Leavers Forum. And then we're going to look wider about how we get voice from our children here in child protection, children in need, and our children with disabilities. So right across the piece, we'll be looking at how we incorporate voice in everything we write and everything we deliver. It's a big ask. We've got numbers of young children, young people, and getting their voice is really quite difficult at times. And we have to think outside the box almost as to how some young people like groups, some children like coming to things, some want to do online surveys, which is so we have to devise a variety of ways that we get voice to help us drive anything and everything that we write. So that's a big piece of work. Um, what, uh, what is in the report is the corporate parenting board um, in terms of what we're doing about enabling our corporate parenting leads and members on that board to understand their role. And I'm meeting with the LJ on Friday. It was a report, as you know, uh, back in October. Um, we are, I'm meeting with them all day to look at how we move forward in the new year in terms of the support they're going to offer to the membership of the board and how then Daryl and I are going to do a little roadshow, I think. But we're going to be going across the directorates to talk about corporate parenting and what it means because it's not just children's services that are corporate parents. All of our directorates, we're all corporate parents and we're all corporate parents. So it's about how we drive that message really and enable people to what being a corporate parent means. And it's not just children's social care. And it's lost in local authorities. So we're going to be building on that. Um, we've not set the project, we'll be setting that before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we'll be out across the directorates. Um, and we we'll to talk to any group that would like to talk to us about being a corporate parent. And it's about skilling people up and that understanding. Um, I've talked about the strategy. We are, as we already raised, we are looking at marketing recruitment for foster carers. As we know, every local authority is struggling to recruit foster carers um, and retain foster carers. 
foster how we retain those foster carers, but how we recruit foster carers to be behind a foster carer as all local authorities. We have a new marketing team manager who is working on that and we'll roll that out as we move into the new year. Um, the IU people will be involved in the recruitment and the training of carers. That doesn't even need to say. We are, in terms of uh, some questions, we've got a no, uh, quite a high number of new people who are not in their education training or employment. A lot of training providers closed during COVID, and that's reduced the capacity that we have out in Herefordshire to, to work with education and training providers without, for our young people. We are looking at a strategy and we're looking at our virtual school about how we enable that to happen. We're also looking at the roles within the virtual school we have. To people 16, 17, to enable them to move on from school, to move into the world of work. We are going to be looking at apprenticeships in the new year. So hopefully by April we'll have a couple of apprenticeships for care services across our corporate parenting services. Uh, but particularly will be involved in the setting up of our Children in Care Council and our care leaders. So that's the work that we're rolling out in the new year. Um, in terms of accommodation more widely, we're looking at our security strategy. So what accommodation options do we have for our young people? We do have in the new year. The uh, part of levelling up, um, and we've got three year funding for that post. And they will come alongside our housing partners to look at what is on offer. We we'll write a housing protocol that is a shared protocol. It's again back to corporate parenting. And we will look at what is available across There's some very rural areas, obviously. We've got the town centre, city centre. But what is on offer to our young people when they move on and beyond their care experience? So that's a piece of work that's going on. Most of the issues that I've got. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We have a number of questions. Just for clarification, I think what we've done is shared it. But all the members of the scrutiny have seen the report, and we all take questions into each other to identify the priorities. But no more questions we've raised between us what we think are the key priorities. That's not to say people might have other questions, but to make it more convenient that we are duplicate. Um, as proper scrutiny without too much going into too much of the detail, which isn't so relevant as the priorities. You'll judge on that too. But that's what we've done to try and make an efficient process where we I'll set the ball rolling. And, and um, there are several choices we know. Excuse me a second. David, you wanted to make a point? Did you? Well, you I'll let you go first. Yes, I'd thank like you. Yes, something. set the ball rolling. Um, so it's in key priority area one. It says we want our corporate parents and other key leaders to understand and act on their responsibilities. So, Reading is the new corporate parent board, it's obviously very encouraging. We would say most members of probably the public are more aware of the current strategy, board membership and meetings. Some of you cancelled recently, for example. I think you were quite sure. Can the lead member therefore please update us on the progress being made to improve communications and what evidence is to show that the of members, leaders, and partners helps the increasing and do have the data on what the public think and our confidence of our new corporate parenting strategy? We know the LGA reports of growing understanding of their corporate parenting responsibilities, a fair review of our corporate plan across council services and partners, but improvement is still needed. And that was their recommendation from the paradigm four of the LGA feedback. Shall I go? Yeah, so, so it's obviously um, the strategy, the revised hasn't been published yet. It will go to the Corporate Parenting Board in uh, uh, January, as we've said. Keely, uh, in, in respect of the original strategy, uh, same now, so it's corporate leadership. Uh, cabinet members, and we've done briefings for members uh, six months and uh, members of the corporate parenting. Uh, certainly, in terms of um, the the early blue strategy, um, in terms of who we mean and what we mean. Um, in terms of uh, communications, we're looking at um, different channels of. 
just don't feel we communicate with children and young people who are in our care or who, or who are care experienced. Uh, and then also with uh, parents and carers, to carers, um, members of the uh, workforce in other agencies as well. So we're looking at different strands of that. Um, so again, that's all kind of to be the stuff that will be coming to corporate parenting board in uh, January, I think. Answered the gist of your question. Yeah, we're aware that there's obviously crossover. Yeah. Looking at the LGAs to ask the questions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and In scrutiny, we're obviously picking up the things that need improvement. Yeah, taking red, there are some good things too. And it's a new report. Uh, come on to some of you wanted to ask a question. Oh, you are you both, yeah, so your hand, Helen. Yes, uh, about about this, yes. yes, just to say that I sit on the corporate parenting board and I'm very confused. Um, and for example, our LGA, why was our last LGA meeting postponed until January? Um, and we get things very last minute, and I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, am I alone in being very confused? Um, thank you. Um, yes, please, please um, give me a ring if there's something you're confused about. Um, we've got the, we've got a meeting tomorrow, as you know, and we've all had the um, agenda for quite a while. And as far as updates on. Um, LGA training will be talking about that tomorrow. <coughs> Just for the meeting tomorrow, why are we not meeting in Plow Lane? Why is it the assembly rooms? Um, you know, because actually I wanted to attend virtually because I have a, a lot of things on. But why can we not meet here? Yeah, no, it, it's very annoying when there aren't enough available rooms. Sometimes it just aren't. Yeah, sorry about but, that. But they should have been planned mm. Mm. that, it, I mean, it's very sorry, important. If, if, if the meeting was planned for the conference suite, there is works being undertaken to the conference suite, which mm. have only just been confirmed, which is why some need to be done. Mm. So that's, that's why they could have made some last minute movements. Mm. Okay, fair question there. There's some reasonable answers, but we may, you raised the point about uh, the meetings at Right. David, you wanted to ask a yeah. question. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going over the health and well being um, section. Um, I was in the on the board seven years until <coughs> I just hope it has improved since the old days. But I'm looking, reading through it, um, well being mental health and what's what's being done. And I see very, very much the same things as uh, as always been on there. There's no changes. Uh, most of it is not person to person except for clients. Most of it is either online or now my big concern is that one of the biggest problems with terms of mental health is substance abuse. There's a lot of substance abuse. I understand it's increasing from, what I, from people I've spoken to in the past couple of months, especially after COVID in council. Uh, turning point. I don't see any mention of turning point. Now, substance, substance abuse and mental health go in tandem, they don't go alone. And we, it seems to me that we need to start doing something rather than put the information out there that you can contact if you want. We need to substance abuse to turning point and get turning point more involved, my feeling. Can you, can you tell me that's in the future? So we work very closely with turning point and numbers of IU people uh, I can't give you the, the exact number today, yeah. but people are referred to turning point. The, n the numbers are not increasing. We have people who have COVID through their reasons, um, have been involved with turning point for a while. Um, we work very closely alongside them. Uh, they work very closely to social workers and to support our children and young people. So. I guess I'm a little confused as to why you think we're not doing that because that work is on is absolutely ongoing. Well, I was talking to Turning Point today, and they're they're looking to improve things. And for our younger people now, they are 
focusing more on young people, but that's all fairly new. They, ha they haven't got much of a, a, a place in, in Hereford yet. They have two offices. One is not is very rarely open. So I am looking at that personally. So I don't, I, I know you're saying in the mental health field, there's, there's more abuse, there's more use of, of drugs, there's more, but there's still more of it going on. And I think we need to, rather than just have, you know, Kuthin and Quell is all very good and CAMS do their is strictly a text thing. Uh, we really need to show a face to face, a personal. A, a so we have Union Street, which is where our care leader service is based currently. Um, and we have our, our health team, our, our looked after health team work from there. They meet our young people there face to face. Young people drop in. We've currently got a number of groups running from there. So we've got a CV group, we've got a parent and child group, and we've got a book club running from there. We did a lot of work in the October half week, Care Leavers Week, and we did a lot of work with our young people about what they wanted and what kind of group they wanted to run and what kind of um, We did um, marketers, we did lots of consultation with our young people. So we have a, we have a lot of information from our 60 plus young people. Um, and a lot of that information will feed the local offer and the strategy that I'm writing. And partnership working is absolutely critical to enabling our young people to move on into the community and be resilient when they move on. So we're we'll, at uh, Turning Point, we're at our marketplace. So they spent a lot of time talking to staff and to young people. I don't know because I, I, I don't know what information you have, but I. But certainly our service area is making referrals and working with Turning Point. I'm happy to pull, pull some information together. Would you do that, Absolutely. please? Because yeah. I would appreciate it. Yeah. Because for me, it's it's not happening. And, you know, I what you're saying, you know, but it's not happening in my mind. And I need to see something and be more involved in it. I'm going to be involved in that. You mental health work. Absolutely. So we'll bring the information to the, to the next panel. Uh, I'll get you that information. Thank you. Okay, so question two refers to um, the right to an effective education and the priority area two, we want our children to reach their potential or they're saying they want to reach their potential, which is where I think I came from. Um, virtual uh, head school head teacher isn't here. Um, so you referred already to this, it means that 59% are out of employment, educational training. We don't really have the figures about that as well. As the older cohort of children who've left education or whether there's a step where you're getting absences from schooling in the lower age group. So that's one area that I'm concerned about. And, um, So deterioration you've referred to has been linked to loss of trainers in um, during the COVID period or a lot of loss of apprenticeships or whatever or training opportunities. But with, without the actual spread, so we can see which age we don't really know with clarity whether you know, there are children lower down the educational ladder, if you like, through the net. So.
So, so again, we, we're, not, we're not talking about individuals. Yeah, I'm not naming names, but yeah. I mean, that's the fact, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and alternative arrangements are always put in place when somebody's upset in that arrangement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Thank we you. should understand that the participation worker is one person, and actually, a little bit like safeguarding, participation is all of our business. So that there were uh, changes put in place, and we have done a lot in the last month while that particular person has not been around. You mentioned yeah. the person. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mike, I think you want to ask a question about housing and stable family life. It's number seven now, a question we do. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, this um, tells us that the number of children with three or more placement moves has fallen to 2% in the past six months. Can you say from what and how do you account for that? And are we making greater support available for foster carers when difficulties arise? So to start with the, with the second part of the question, so we, we are certainly making more support available for foster carers and it kind of links to the public, public question earlier on. Um, so one part of that is the introduction of a, a psychologist into the fostering support team so that when foster carers are working with supporting challenging behaviour, they've got uh, that support available to them to better understand that behaviour and work with that. Uh, and we're doing, currently doing a piece of work with our foster carers about the um, learning and development opportunities for them going forward and the support networks for them going forward, recognising that there's been gaps in that in, in recent years. Um, in terms of the specifics of from what, I don't have that in my head, but I, I can produce that as a, as a written response for you. In terms of that data over the last two or three years. We've got that data. Um, just one other, uh, what, what actions are available to stabilise the situation when a child is unhappy with their foster family? Um, so the first instance is to listen to the child, understand why they're unhappy, uh, and then try to mediate that. Um, but it, it ultimately, if, if a, if a uh, placement in a family home isn't working, then we have to look at what the alternatives are. Um, the part of the uh, education psychologist and the fostering support team is try to understand and work with both the carers and the child in, in the family placement to, to understand the behaviour and, and, and also the carer's response to that. So over time and, and experience, many of those situations resolve themselves. Sometimes the match just isn't right um, and we have to listen to the child. In the Thank you. There's an last bit on that question, I think, Michael, there isn't there? Bit the housing worker post. Oh, okay, yeah, I thought um, they did answer a bit on the. Uh, yeah. yeah, is the housing worker post solely for care experience leavers? What will that? What will be the scope of this post? Will it include support for young people to manage their finances to cope with their rental responsibilities? Without this, a guarantor scheme might get into difficulties. Okay, so the housing worker is only for care experienced young people. That, that scope of the, 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 the support we've been given from uh, the department. Um, and they will work alongside housing providers and, and our personal advisors in the leading care team to look at what's available out there to make those relationships with those providers. So where there are any issues with young people who may get into difficulties with, with the first port of call rather than a young person being given notice to quit, for instance, their accommodation. In terms of, will they work around finance? Not particularly, but they'll support the PAs. What we're going to do in the new year is run what we're going to call um, living on your own. We, moving to independence is, is, independence is a strange word in itself. So we're calling it living on your own because that's a bit starker in terms of making people think about what happens when they move on at the age of 18 and beyond. So we've, we're going to be running a um, preparing to live on your own course um, that will include financial management, it will include in how you cope emotionally when you close the door and you know you're inside and you're literally on your own and everybody else is not there because that's quite stark for our young people. So we we talk we talk historically, I've heard you talk about can you people cook, most young people can pour hot water in a pot noodle. Um, you know, can they but can you people change a plug? Do they know what can they change a light bulb? So some of those more practical things that happen when you live on your own. But a lot of work around emotionally living on your own is what we're going to be looking at. Um, and finance being, you know, Pretty critical. If you get your money and you spend it all today and then you've got no food, how are you going to cope? And if you can't pay your electricity bill, what is going to happen? So having those real conversations. We're going to do some work with our foster carers and, and residential home providers to look at what they're doing and help and support them to enable young people to look at all of those things because invariably young people move on, whether that's 18 or whether that's later if they stay put. 
Um, the rent guarantor scheme we don't have here, but we uh, we are looking at that. I have again a pro forma that I'll be delivering to DLT after Christmas with this whole raft of paperwork. And that and then gives young people security and gives providers security when our young people move on at the age of 18, that we're still their parent and if they fall over we will pick them up, is what we're going to do. Okay, Sam, yeah. have you had a point? Have you finished? Have you, yeah. 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 Sam, have you had a point? Yeah, just to follow on from the housing officer role, is there no way of using levelling up money to actually incentivise housing associations to make available properties that already exist? And if we go back slightly, I think, you know, we talked about no wrong door working with, with, you know, the voice of the child. Previously, you had SHIFT, which had 50 units of accommodation that specifically had 16 to 25 year olds. There were um, at least 20 of those properties specifically for care leavers. And um, the local authority back in the day, probably 15 years ago, co-invested with the housing association to specifically purchase flats for care leavers. Whether those are still used or not, I, I worry that the institutional memory of the local authority had lost things like that in the past. And um, there was a direct placement arrangement where anybody leaving care had first opportunity to be placed in any one of those 50 units of accommodation. We also have uh, we, we had New Dawn, we had Shelter, we had Home Group. All of these organisations have ultimately slipped away, mainly because the relatively small local authority contracts got smaller and smaller and smaller. And for a big housing association, it was no longer a viable option for them. And they simply decided to prioritise other client groups because there's such a shortage of housing. So rather than another worker to do another load of joint protocols and another load of organisations, <laughs> what would be far better is some incentivisation that says, housing association will make it worth your while. They've got plenty of properties that could be used, is my point. I uh, absolutely agree with you that the relationship with providers and the department to level up um, needs to change and be more creative. Obviously, I've got no influence over uh, departments of levelling up policy in terms of how they use the money. Um, but, um, and obviously, the, the can't, I can't speak to kind of past and, and ceased uh, arrangements or contracts between the council and, and other providers, but certainly in terms of local authority budgets now, because it's really very different to what it was. Did you describe 15 years ago? But yeah, we're working closely with the uh, Department for Leveling Up at the minute about how we might creatively um, work with them and use their influence to, to work with providers in, in the council. We so do follow on, Sam. Sorry. Sorry, we do have two organisations that we're working with here in Herefordshire, in, in Hereford actually, uh, where 16 to 25 accommodation is available in single flats. So we are working with them. It's not, it's not. You know, when new people need to move on, that becomes issue. They currently don't have priority status, and that is something that this shared joint housing protocol. It's not a homeless protocol; it's a housing protocol. I'm hoping that's going to address that. Uh, you know, we're back to this notion of corporate parenting, that housing our corporate parents too, um, and that's what we're working on with housing with the support of the department for leveling up, and that's part of what this worker will do. This all happened. Yeah. We, at the moment, we've got money for the work, but there are other things that Daryl says we are going to discuss in the day. Two quick ones. So, I mean, first of all, the uh, the argument we've always made and continue to make is the amount of money that ends up being spent on temporary accommodation and emergency accommodation yeah. is if that is invested properly into decent accommodation, yeah. it actually doesn't cost the local authority anything extra. The second thing is, is that I personally have been here representing the diocese saying that we as a diocese, but also there are other you know, social investors out there who have significant capital, that if they knew what they were investing in, fitted closely to a local authority strategy, then they would feel confident about putting their money into a particular thing if it, if it helped. Um, I mean, Venture are another example, and they've taken on uh, the Merton to try and provide additional accommodation. They've pretty much done that off their own back, as opposed to something that's been a supportive program uh, through conversations. I think sometimes we need to say, thank you, please, yes, we'd like to work with you, and we'll accept your money. It's not quite conventional, but we'll work with it. And, and, uh, and I know you're having conversations with the Commission team around the regular strategies as well. So points noted. You want to ask some question, Karen? Yeah, I, I just wondered, is, is there a relationship with strategic housing and, and children's, because I know that the you know, the, the history, strategic housing, hold that, is that kind of corporate history. And, and I just wonder how close the working relationship with strategic housing is. Yes, we do. And that's that's the writing of this joint protocol to bring, to bring us even 
much to close more closely together if you like so we're working together on delivering that and then delivering hopefully better outcomes for our children and people thank you you want to ask the next question i think as well on uh, uh, mental health i think that's question eight on the paper yeah it, it was really to say that uh, a lot of other authorities actually fund a range of interventions for young people with mental health difficulties uh, such as art, music, drama or movement therapy and are we providing any of these in Herefordshire um, and why would the role of a psychologist really be a better provision? Is it, you know, is it a case of one or the other or can we actually provide some therapeutic uh, work for, for young people in the county? So we don't currently provide it as discrete services. So uh, on individual care plans uh, for some young people where there's an identified need, we fund a range of interventions and support, which includes the kind of the examples that you've described there. We don't uh, provide a discrete service in our own right that, that does those individual activities. Uh, and what we'll sometimes do is where there's an identified need is work with our colleagues in, in any number of uh, health services as well provided that so it tends to generate on an individual need by need basis through the child or that child care plan. <coughs> okay then again I, I'd just like to follow up on that because I know Mon does share do this. And um, and you know if well it's hard for for children to ask for something if they don't know it's there. So that's the first thing, and and if with the with camps being so overstretched, are they going to be able to go? Um, well, we want you to do this. Oh, oh, there's no service. So so what we end up doing is just the people that have the capacity and the support to battle hard enough because they know about oh art therapy or movement therapy worked for somebody else. So we're going to push hard for it. It's very, it's very hard to, I just think, a psychologist, I suppose, would, you know, assess the child, but, you know, what else would they do? The, the, the psychologist that we're bringing to the service is more about working with foster carers to support challenging behaviour. Okay, so it's not a, a provision for children. So that's a different, okay. um, yeah. So, um, I think you make uh, pair of you make valid points, and we'll we'll go away and think about that, and, and, and come back. Yeah, but I don't think there's an answer particularly for that yeah. one. Right? Okay, thank you, Helen. Do you want to ask a question on um, physical health? Yes, physical health number thirty-one. Yeah, um, it says in respect of initial health assessments, a new process has been put in place. Um, it, can we have more details on the new process? Is that possible? We absolutely you can, and I'll ask you to do that. But again, I'm just going to point out as an observation, this is the work that the court presented because they received a detailed report from the Looked After Children's Health Team recently as well. So it's just raising again the observation which we just need to think about going forward is how scrutiny scrutinizes the work of the corporate presidency board. But Judy, do you want to answer the question? So um, health will attend now every corporate parenting board and will provide a report on initial health assessment, repeat health assessment, review health assessment, trial and dentistry. And that will happen at every board meeting. So a report will be presented there and that will start tomorrow. Um, and I meet with our looked after health teams monthly um, <coughs> in terms of IHAs and RHAs. And I get copied in now to every IHA that's been asked for so I can also speak to the service managers and heads of service because not all of the children sit in my world, they sit in our, our court teams. Um, so I can chase that and then we, we make sure that the circle is closed as it were, the information comes in, we drive that as the service, the information goes back to help, it's then put on the system and then it's there for the child. So the figures are improving and that report will be tomorrow uh, and we certainly have a level of scrutiny of it that we didn't have previously. Yeah, we hear so much of all this, we are going to, we are going to, it will be so wonderful when we hear, we have done. But we, ha we have done, so I've been having, I've been having one meeting for the last three months with health. So I meet them, we review, I get the information, it is happening, it's been happening for the last three months, and the report tomorrow will have done so. I'm interested in how you think some things we should be asking some we should we'll have that conversation so, yeah i think that's a discussion to yeah. be had and the next question might come into that same category but James yeah so i'm, I'm just sort of going to try and praise it a bit because um you know obviously when you're reading a report your mind goes everywhere but i had a wonderful experience when i had my head on the other day <laughs> um basically
be, it was somebody who was offering boxer size to, um, to some of the pupil referral units on a voluntary basis. And she told me an anonymised and very moving story about her engagement with a young person who was at risk of making really poor choices. And the turnaround for him, and I'm not ashamed to say I was in tears listening to it. So what I want to know is, are we consulting with our education facilities, parent bodies, to understand the expertise and goodwill that's out there in the community and that we could be tapping into? I think the the the, um, the kind of the answer similar to one early on is not enough at the moment. So Julie's talked to you about the, the conversations with Halo to provide more uh, more yeah, sporting opportunities and exercise opportunities for young people. Uh, we did some work with schools at the minute to look at how we can support uh, looked after children in, in education as well as care leaders in college. But I think the, the short answer is no, not enough. And that's part so of you're not contacting hairdressers, for instance. <laughs> no, I don't have. I, you'll probably appreciate. I don't have a lot of personal contact with hairdressers. But 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 talk communities, but talk communities right? another area where yeah. we do where we talk. I had a conversation yeah. last week at the World Cafes as well about how yeah. we can do much more of that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And the last question, official on list, Helen, you were going to ask something you didn't know about. Um, just about the um, task and finish group on risk management at the corporate parenting board i haven't i haven't apparently it's been set up but i don't know anything about it so we have a <coughs> weekly meeting to look at our children who are placed in high cost accommodation and rachel gillett chairs that meeting and the head of service attend that meeting and we discuss the plans for all of those children uh, in terms of where they're currently living if that's the most appropriate place for them to be and how we can bring those children if they're out of county back home to Herefordshire. So those meetings happen every week. Um, so that's task and finish, but not not. A it's not really task and finish. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a, a it's a regular weekly meeting that Rachel chairs. Because it says it's a task, task and finish group. No, it's not. Task so task that's that's not correct. Then. It's called the task and finish group in the report. Right, it's yeah. called high cost meeting is what we call it. <laughs> okay. We, we, we can correct the term uh, Last question, I think, on this report, plans of science. Yeah. I do have a bit of an issue with the suggestion that we're not doing anything with our young people, because we are. Uh, we, talking really is doing quite a bit. Um, they, put, they put funding into painting, art classes. They put funding in. There's a repair shop starting up in Dinder that young people can go to that very nicely. Uh, they're doing swimming. They're doing cycling. There's all kinds of stuff going on that, that talking with is doing, so we shouldn't put it down, we should recognise that. I don't think either of us said that we weren't, and I think we recognise the work the tall community did and individual care plans. I don't think we said that they weren't. And I'm at the point of chair, there's lots of good things happening, yeah. but what we're focusing on is the areas of improvement. That's certainly nothing that lots of good things, but our job is to look at where improvement can be made to enhance what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, we totally agree with you as a committee, yeah, and I hope the officers understand that we're asking the questions about the improvement areas. But, uh, and, and not say how great everything is because we're here to do a scrutiny job. Well, thank you, David. Unless there's any questions, I'd like to ask that some of the proposals that we accept the report with the questions that we've asked. And thank you. Thank you. Secondly, Councillor Stone. Before we vote, does anybody uh, on the leaders or the, um, the member want to make any points about anything you've raised? Right. All those in favour accepting the report with the conclusion withdrawn? I think that's unanimous and all those able to go. Thank you very much. We'll move on then to the next item. I just wonder whether people want a five minute break or do you want to carry on? Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Democratic services, are we connected with the live service again? Um, or are we still uh, not able to, to, to an extent, Chairman, I would say. I think hopefully the remote participants can hear us if they right. if not see us. Right. Okay. So and we are recording the session. Well, we'll carry on item eight on the agenda which is the Children's Services Improvement Plan. Right, Darrell, would you be opening up or would you as Covenant member down and be opening up to the Improvement Plan? Okay. Darrell, over to you to introduce us to the Improvement Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so again, I'll assume um, the paper and the, and the attachments have, have been read. Um, the history in terms of why we, we need to submit uh, a plan to Ofsted in December is clear. We were inspected during the summer this year and we found to be an
adequate across the board. As part of the inspection framework, we submit a high-level um, action plan to Ofsted uh, by a certain timescale, and for us, that's the 30th of uh, December. Um, Ofsted are very clear in their framework that they don't want and need um, the kind of the minutiae, the, 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 all of the detail behind each of the actions. Um, so it is intentionally high level and sets out intent and framework of infrastructure type activities. Um, the work programme behind this is set up into seven work streams. Each of those work streams has a member of the corporate leadership team as its um, uh, responsible officer. Um, and each of those work programmes then has a, has a programme uh, plan, if you like, or a detailed plan behind it. Um, so again, when scrutiny comes to look in detail at elements of the improvement plan next year, we can kind of, if you'd like, we can sort of look in detail at each of those work streams. And we talked about that earlier in terms of one example, for example, the SEND work stream yeah. in the question that we answered earlier on. So there's a lot more detail that sits in the delivery plans behind this plan. Um, there's reference in here to the um, governance arrangements and the relationship with the improvement board. There's obviously a reference in here to, to the fact that we have a children's commissioner who will, uh, in uh, the very near future, be reporting to the Secretary of State with her recommendations. Notwithstanding, we still need to submit a, an improvement plan to Ofsted that addresses the nine areas for improvement that Ofsted identified following our inspection <coughs> earlier in the year. Um, this paper goes to uh, Cabinet on Thursday this week, so just to remind the uh, Screening Committee that it's, it's uh, in, in their gift and constitution to make recommendations to the Executive if they choose to, and then Democratic Services and ourselves will take those recommendations into Cabinet on uh, Thursday afternoon. So um, what I won't do is go into any great detail, uh, I'm conscious of time, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but obviously uh, Gail Hancock is our service director for improvement. Yeah, of course, um, we'll, between us, we'll try to answer as many of the questions that you will have. Uh, and obviously, we've got Gladys, uh, as chair of the improvement board, here at the meeting as well. Great, thank you. What we've done is broken down the questions into each of the ten areas: the nine areas of improvement and the second area, and try to pick out some key questions. Not so much with a view to making recommendations in two days to go, but just to make sure that any of the key detail that maybe could be useful to explore in scrutiny. That's the view we take. And there may be some recommendations come out of it. Basically, that's our approach, given that there's only a day and a half to go. OK, so first of all, under corporate responsibility, Jenny, you want to lead us up with a question? Yeah, right? so um, my reflection on this was that embedded in this report document lies the one seed plan change. The references are few, but they are there. <clears throat> and the quality of practice we hear launch our practice model to emphasise the importance of relationships, respect and restorative practice for how we work, and here I note the future tense, the will, <clears throat> with children, young people, parents and carers, especially where this may not have been their experience previously, as a cabinet member has acknowledged it's all about relationships. However, um, despite the belief from some quarters of this council that parents have many places they can go to get their voices heard, this doesn't appear to be the case. And parents who believe themselves to have been the recipient of unfair treatment from children and young people's directorate historically, and some people are saying presently, have been forced to share publicly the experiences they have had of please being ignored, email. demonstrate the importance of relationships. So this is the question for those who have corporate responsibility. What proposals can you immediately propose to facilitate parents, carers and children both in public meetings and at every point of contact so that their voices are heard, but more importantly to avoid their having to bring their upsetting stories at huge personal costs into the public arena? Thank you. <coughs> have you considered, and I'm going to sound like a record got stuck, you know, I'm going to have it printed on my head, 
trauma awareness training for officers and members. It really needs to happen. Everybody in this committee needs it. I need it. We all need it. We need to understand that when we have someone in the room, we don't always know why they're becoming upset, but there's usually a reason. So, you know, I really want this to happen for this council because I think it would make an enormous amount of difference. And I'm sorry that um, the CEO's not here because I think that's part of his bag, maybe. Because it's a corporate responsibility. So that's my plea. So um, uh, we are absolutely considering uh, how we uh, introduce trauma-informed practice and trauma awareness as part of our learning development next year as part of our relational or restorative practice approach going forward. <coughs> That's a key plank of uh, not only changing our practice but also signalling to others that, that our practice is changing and, and, and that will link as well to the listening to families approach. Um, in terms of uh, the different platforms, um, I agree with you. Um, we we need to work with families, uh, including the families that are in the room, to um, to try to make a safe space where we can have these conversations and, and not be in the public arena in the, in the way that isn't helpful for families. So, um, trauma awareness training? Uh, I think I answered that one a bit first. That's one of the approaches we're looking at for our learning development programme. Yeah, but you're talking about for your directorate, and in my personal opinion, every single officer who has a responsibility corporately to answer parents needs needs to have that training. I mean, I don't know quite how we would do it, but I went to a really good um, delivery from Health Watch where they were rolling out understanding childhood aces and body language and tone of voice and safe space and all those things which facilitate members who you know, often, you know, without that sort of scaffolding, are at a loss to know how to, how to respond, you know. I mean, you can be personally skilled just by accident in your life, or you can be scaffolded to do that work, so. I think our, our recommendation would be that, given everything that Jenny said, and clearly that um, reflects well in what the public thinking too, that sometimes go on priority to trauma training for members as well as officers would be something I think would be something we should really raise higher than it currently is at the moment because yes. having been to these meetings it's very difficult for members of the public mm -hmm. and members to properly empathise you said that when we're working under rules where we don't understand how trauma might affect how those rules are applied so I think that would be a key recommendation to make to cabinet on Thursday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question two, under that same heading, uh, would you like to ask this question, Fiona? I think it was one you raised, which is the, the um, uh, page, page 36, what, uh, what the page 36 was, it says it was one of your questions, I think. Yes. Um, it's on page four. Mm -hmm. Or page four. Because I think this actually has been answered as I think it was on it was on that's asked as a public question. I'm not sure it has. And, the, and did you ask um, I asked a supplementary question? The consultation for about the consultees? Yes. You're happy with that then? No. It's been asked as a it's been asked as a public question for Thursday's cabinet, I believe, you know, isn't it? Has it and therefore do you want me to ask it to hear? Do you feel the, yeah. the answer to your satisfaction? Well, Right? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um I'll that, Um this um this improvement plan has been prepared in collaboration with a range of stakeholders, including children. This is quoting this is quoting from the improvement plan. Mm -hmm. This improvement plan has been prepared in collaboration with a range of stakeholders, including children, young people, parents and carers the workforce and multi-agency cross-sector partners. We will continue engaging with our stakeholders to further develop a local conversation whereby we will listen, address feedback and take appropriate action as an integral part of our improvement journey as we move forward. However, the list of 11 consultees does not include any third families consultees. 
Please outline the ways in which both families have been consulted on drafting the plan and how you will continue to engage them. That's it, thank you. So, uh, so there's certainly a written response to this question uh, in, in Cabinet on um, on Thursday. I think the, the um, so in terms of the consultation events that we held uh, in, in recent months, um, no, so the only feedback that we got in terms of um, uh, parent carer families was through organisations such as Parent Carer Voice, the Health Watch and the like. Uh, and again, we've, we've kind of said it a couple of times in this meeting already, um, we recognise, I certainly recognise, that there aren't enough forum at the minute to have a meaningful engagement, and that's why we're developing the Listening to Families approach, which we want to publish and consult on early in the new year. So that as so this is a high-level plan, it's the first um, iteration in the sense of the one for Ofsted. Um, each time Ofsted come back in the future and do a monitoring visit, it will be refreshed and updated and I'm saying the detail of delivery plans that sit behind it. So there's an absolute recognition, Fiona, that there's not enough of that activity going on at the moment, and that's why we want to work with uh, families and groups to um, to deliver on a listening to families approach, so it's not just a title and not just a piece of paper. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think that illustrates the question of sense of the yeah, and so the work to be done. Thank you, thank you, Fiona. Can we move on to the next question. Um, I think Sam, you probably write down the next question, which is question three on page top of page five. Yeah. So, uh, like or wrongly, I encourage a number of head teachers to give me feedback on, on their experience of things as well as their conceptual plans. So there are quite a few questions coming from head teachers. Um, in, in a sense, this is a perception issue. Um, so, a particular head has a perception that uh, once a family has accessed uh, an intervention uh, through early help or venture or something similar that they then can't access a lesser degree of service. They get slightly stuck in the system. And that's similar to stories of where people are referred from one level to the next. Mm. And it's a higher level of support officially, but there's less capacity to deliver that support. So again, families are stuck waiting for that higher level of intervention. Is that perception correct? And what are we doing to address that problem? Um. I guess without looking at individual circumstances, I don't know. In, in, but certainly, there are certainly some realities around capacity, both at low level, you know, universal early help, uh, and um, higher levels of staff you need. So, so that will be some people's experience certainly that they have to wait for a service, whether it's at a, a lower level of intervention or a higher level of intervention. Um, can't claim that as a system of which we're part, we've got that right completely at the moment at all. Um, and certainly, um, perception. With head teachers is, is a focus in itself, and, and this far the service for education are working on. But how do we engage with schools differently and better in the new year? And how do we go out to head teachers and schools forums and that? Yeah. Okay. Would it be helpful? Because there were quite a few points that the primary teacher made. And would it be helpful to share that? Yeah, yeah. And maybe deliver to cabinet as well, so they can see the comments of a primary teacher. We can pass that on. Yeah, and we've got this anonymised, so we can just share that document. It was really useful to get that comment from somebody, a practitioner. Okay, thank you. Oh, now it's we're... not so much a question. Can I, can I just double check that the parent care voice? What's your understanding of who that's open to? Because our understanding as parents is it's only available for children with disabilities, and actually leaves out a whole range of other parents. And if you're using that as your mechanism to get input, you're going to get a really slight. Like, tiny fraction of the okay, so you, you yeah. made the point, and I, I did say that we accept that. Please, we've had plenty of input. If you want, one, please do ask that question. Can you put it in an email? Because I think that's a really important question to ask. Uh, but if you could do that, really appreciate it. Thank you. Next question, which we go on to the second element now the sufficient stability of staff. And Mike, you wanted to ask that question. I think. First question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, there is nothing in the improvement plan that suggests anything new or innovative will be attempted to address the social work recruitment issue. The same is true of the shortage of foster carers. There is nothing about partner agencies being part of the pathway, e.g. placements, developments of roles from early help into social work. Can you say what will actually be um, different and what will the yeah, outcome be different this time. And then also, could you update us on the foster recruitment um, uh, person that was employed last year and targets set for 
Yeah. So, top ahead, I don't have the recruitment data in, in in terms of foster care, so I'll have to come back to you on that one. Um, that, was, that wasn't the kind of was a question I was anticipating, and I, yeah. I just don't, I just don't have it in my head. Um, but in terms of um, uh, the, the recruitment, so of social workers and and others and career progression and the like. So currently, uh, we have. Uh, too high a proportion of our workforce, in my mind certainly, um, and I suspect in Gladys is as well, uh, of a workforce that is interim and local, and we want to have a much greater proportion of our workforce that is permanent, um, experienced social workers ideally. Um, and we're trying to recruit in, in what you know, because we've had the conversation that's written a couple times before, is, is a really difficult and challenging national environment. There is a shortage of experienced social workers in the country. Um, and. Uh, not only ourselves, but other organisations in Herefordshire, such as West Mercia Police um, and the CCG and others, are struggling to recruit. There are significant vacancies for, for, for professionals and qualified individuals in a number of agencies. So we're increasing the number of social work apprentices uh, next year. We're increasing the numbers of newly qualified social workers and social work students that we're supporting, so that we're trying to grow our own and have a, have a flow, if you like, uh, in the medium and long term. Um, we intend to have a conversation with uh, our, with the DfE and with Ofsted about how we might uh, think about using um, people with different skills and experiences in some of our teams. Because not everything that happens in a social work service needs to be done by social workers. Mm -hmm. And so more family support workers, for example, uh, and others, uh, and using people with different skills, experience and qualifications. How you move to that position needs to be carefully considered and planned. And obviously, because we're an inadequate local authority uh, with concerns about practice, we also need to make sure that children are safe and that our practice is improving in that process. So that's something that we are actively looking at at the moment. Uh, we've got a new recruitment microsite, many more adverts out there live at the moment, um, uh, and are working hard, I'll say, in, a, in what is a difficult recruitment environment to recruit more permanent workers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Stan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, on this question of recruitment and retention, it's come up many times before, mm. um, and it's constantly been discussed in the national media as well. Mm. But I have noticed recently that one or two councils in different parts of the country, I think Gloucestershire may have been one, have been more successful in recruiting um, social workers and foster carers and others, and as a result, they've been able to get improvements to their Ofsted rating. I wonder if we're taking enough notice of what some other councils are doing. I know there are some in the same position as us, but I have noticed in the media, one or two, and I can't quote them all at the moment, that have made real strides. I think Somerset might have been one, I'm not sure, in the last few last year and few months. So there are ways of improving the recruitment situation, having more local social workers. But uh, it's probably a long and hard road, but I'm sure there are examples we can follow from elsewhere. There absolutely are, and there's a couple of local authorities who um, have generally considered to have done something really quite different and innovative um, in, in the last year or two that we're talking to about what can we learn from them. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So I'm in, in Sorry, Angie, can, I, can I ask, please, you know, give me plenty of time, or we do you need to get on with it. We but... get one question, and it's so frustrating that we can't be part of a fluid conversation, and, you know, we've demonstrated this that it's not happening. Do you mean in this meeting, or outside? Or outside of this yeah, meeting. Yeah, we understand that, and noted. That we, I think we've got lots of reassurance, haven't we? Improving on that, there's a lot way to go, but hopefully I'm improving. I, I mean, I, I would make it quite publicly known, I refuse to put up a poster for you guys recruiting foster carers at my place of work because I have no faith and okay. confidence in you. How many people out there are doing that? We'll are back. you actually asking those questions? We'll come back and ask that question. Can I move on with the... Helen, I think you want to ask the next question on the RAG ratings. Um, RAG. Thank you for the thought. Yes, RAG. Um, I did add all the different colours, and I'm not sure I got it right, but... Um, and there are a lot of yellows, which is, which is very worrying because it says started with some issues slash delay. That means, that means delay means they're not carrying on, doesn't it? And then of course the red is fostering. And we, we went through with the, 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 the public question on fostering, published a lot, but that is really worrying, the fact that fostering is 
in red and not on track and at risk. So, um, have we seen the fostering information leaflet, which it says has been completed? And where is this available? Some additional questions on fostering. Uh, so that's the private fostering information right. leaflet, yeah. and, and that is available, and we can provide you a copy of that. I think in terms of the rag rating, so yellow doesn't mean it's not happening, it means there are issues and some delay. One, we've tried to be really honest uh, and transparent in our approach, both in terms of capturing the improvement that we need to do and where we're at with some of it at the minute. Um, you'd be quite right to be um, worried and concerned if everything was green, um, because we know that it's not. Um, so we're, we're trying to be uh, provide an honest appraisal of uh, both the opportunities that we've got to improve and the challenges that we've got. There is so much improvement to be done um, that it can't all be achieved uh, all at the same time and at the pace that I would like. Um, there are a lot of people working very hard to deliver improvement. And some of this has to be kind of steps and sequenced that in order for one uh, piece of activity to get to green, if you like, or to deliver the outcomes you want, then another piece of work has to fall in place before that. And that's part of the challenge um, that I've got, my team have got, and that the improvement board have got in terms of trying to make sure we get the pace right and accept that uh, some of this isn't going to go smoothly uh, and it isn't just going to happen overnight in the way that we hope. Because what you often find when you're trying to address and improve one area of practice or one area of the service is you find something else that needs to be improved first that we didn't necessarily know in the level of detail. Thank you. An important question, so not just us, but the public understand what the different colours yeah. mean. Yeah. And I can never remember what rag means. Um, so red, amber, red, green, essentially. Yeah. Is it, is it show, the status, right. show the status okay. of the progress that we're making. I couldn't get the middle. I thought red and green, but I couldn't get the answer. And, and each month... I can't be in asking that question. It's like the traffic lights. Yeah. Yeah. And, and each, each month when we go back to the improvement board in the future, um, this document or a version of this document will be updated in terms of the progress. Uh, and the right yeah. region. And we will and be expecting you'll that. be scrutinising us as all the improvement board. And we're expecting the dashboard for that at the next meeting. I'll yes. we'll come back to that. Did you want to add a supplement? Just a very, very quick question. So that's one of the things that obviously when we're looking at something blank or cold, we go, ah, oh, that. But then what happens before that? And an example would be that, okay, so if children are unhappy, what support is available for? for stopping them moving on and, and increasing their number of placements and keeping them in. So what support then are you going to, to give to foster borrowers? And is there a resource for that? And you know, and so the whole thing goes around. But what would be really helpful to scrutiny, I think, is that some of those you know, loops are made clear and put together. I'd really like that. I find that really helpful. So that you can go, OK, so that's into that, that's into that, that's into that. OK, I get the picture. You know, where, where that really part is stuck, I yeah. need some more. Yeah. And, and that's something you can say, think about how we do that. One of, the, one of the ways that we're planning to do that with the improvement board um, is through kind of storyboards and describing what the, what the lived experience is for a child or a young person yeah. or, or a set of parents um, and, and how, uh, based on their feedback yeah. and, and uh, the experience, how they engage with services and what the differences and that, that yeah. can help tell the story. That we're Explanation of the measurement dashboard, which we're going to be scrutinising next time, will be yeah. really useful to help people understand it. Okay. That's great, thank you. We've got one question on the third area of improvement, the time of over identification of both age of response to children, and that you're going to ask that question next. So, um, yeah, so the, the principal thing here for me is the absence, and, and it's interesting because it's a perfect mirror image of the word, of a strategy for neglect. So neglect is the absence of much going on, and it's one of the most harmful forms of abuse, essentially, neglect for children. But there doesn't seem to be much meat on the bone in this strategy, and I wondered who's picking that up and where they're going with it. So uh, the the, um, the responsibility for the next neglect strategy is the safeguarding partnership, as, as is uh, pointed out in three point eight there. Um, so um, uh, um, an interim neglect strategy was published uh, last month by the partnership, and it's due to be um, um, and it was launched, and it's due to be evaluated in terms of its impact uh, in the spring next year. Uh, but the view is then that um, the kind of the next iteration, the next step in the journey in our neglect strategy published uh, hopefully in the summer or early autumn next year so we've got a one-year interim strategy at the moment okay thank you 
Uh, we, next question we've got is on Group A4, quality of practice, including assessments, and Sam, you want to ask a question about that? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, just as a general observation, there, there's uh, lots of good statements of intent. Um, there's then what's actually happening on the ground in terms of practice, which doesn't mirror the, the ambition that's in the report. And then the progress or the actions, I mean, we heard it earlier, I think, from Melissa, there's a lot of heavy emphasis on protocols and strategies and workshops and tools rather than actual activity. Um, and just the, the point that one of the head teachers wanted to make here under the, the voice of the child, um, that it, it still isn't being heard, um, particularly where social care is supporting parents, uh, the children's voices are often not prioritised. That's their experience. It's a concern that heads are talking about um, and again, you know, kind of what measures are in place that isn't a, a guidance document or a workshop? What are we actually doing to, to, to change that practice? So again, I think it's, it's been recognised a couple of times in, in this meeting that there's a lot more that we need to do there in terms of voice. And Judy spoke about that quite a lot earlier on. Um, so, um, and I kind of, when a, when a local authority is inadequate and has been in decline for um, for years, uh, frankly, um, as has been um, as we've acknowledged in the past, um, then that's fact. A, there is a real importance in making sure that you've got um, structures and protocols and processes. And, because sometimes you just need a benchmark to make sure that people um, behave and practice within within agreed set of uh, frameworks. And then when you've got that compliance improved and that framework in place, um, you move on to make sure you focus on the quality and the impact. Um, so uh, I. One of the things that we'll be reporting to you on um, in the new year um, is the impact of um, uh, of practice in terms of how it's presented through our quality assurance audit. So I know from recent quality assurance audits that there is uh, evidence of improving practice and improving outcomes for children and people. That doesn't come across in some of these performance dashboards in the same way. Um, and we also talked earlier on in this meeting about how as a service, we absolutely recognise we need to find ways with families of being able to capture the voice of families so that it's not just about performance reports and not just about the presence of a strategy or a process or whatever. It's about how we genuinely listen and triangulate that or match that against you know, what children and people tell us, you know, what, what audit of our quality of practice does and what families tell us. And, and that's the journey we're on at the minute. And you know, I've been really clear and I've tried to be very, very honest in, in my time here that, that we've got, we are trying to improve, I'm trying to improve and lead a service from a very low base. Uh, there is some evidence that I'm, I'm positive and optimistic about that we are turning a corner, but I, I don't want to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not saying to you or anybody else in the room that we're, we're two thirds of the way on that journey. We're not, we've got a long way to go. Okay. Uh, Just very quickly, do we seek evidence from, from teachers? Because in terms of getting the voice of the child in there, my experience is that, you know, you might not ask the child directly, but if they come in and you look at them and you say, are you hungry? And they go, they nod their head, you've got the voice of the child and a teacher could report that. So I wonder whether we're doing that. So we certainly do in terms of um, school teacher, other um, schools, um, colleagues in, involved in you know, child in need work, early help, where, where there's a plan and, and an intervention, we certainly do that. One of the conversations that I've been having with a group of head teachers uh, recently, and that is far safety forward, is how we do that a lot better. Because again, you know, children are in school, or most children are in school, 25 days a week, uh, and, the, and the staff in the schools uh, know those children very well, as do the parents and carers. So again, it kind of links to how do we get a better picture of what the lived experience is for the child. Thank you. Thank you. Right, now we've got one question on the timely and effective multi-agency arrangements. And the issue of family group conferences. And Fiona, I know that's the subject you want to ask the question on. Yes. Below is from the draft Hertfordshire Children Services Improvement Plan, December 2022, about family group conferences. Um, the table, which. Yeah, um, from? and then it's, um, and it's develop and launch a family group conference model of approach to engage, etc. But probably the most important point that I would mention is that um, when it says um, it says determine family group conference model and approach <coughs> as soon as possible thereafter, 
So, determine family group conflict model and approach as soon as possible thereafter. Um, and then, my question is, do you consider that deciding on the family group conference model by April 2023 is acting at pace? Um, I would like to have um, more provision now uh, and, and, and certainly early in January. Uh, part, of the, uh, part of the work that we're doing at the minute is, um, is uh, what's the level of provision that we will need so that it's, it has a genuine impact and then I need to recruit so the plan for 1st of April is to have the resource in place rather than make a decision about the resource. Um, so that works ongoing at the minute. Uh, and, and what we want to have is a, a more significant and increased resource from the 1st of April. So I think realistically, that's probably as early as I'm going to be able to put some of those resources in place, given the amount of time it will take to recruit and train individuals. Yeah, so do you think that perhaps the wording could be changed from determined family group? conference model, which I would interpret as just deciding what the model is, to implement a family group conference by April 2023. Yeah, happy to take that on board. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that makes sense. So the improvement plan will be amended, or that's what you would agree to it being amended? Yeah, yeah, I think we can do that. Yeah. Thank you. And a similar question from you about the case on them. Um, they prevented a family support rolling out of the yes. um, And then also I'm quoting from the improvement plan, and this is about preventative family support, in other words, support to prevent um, care proceedings, etc. Um, and then it says, um, and then... It's a table again, yeah. I'm trying to read from it. It says... Educare strategy undertaken. So, educare strategy underwear and to be completed January 23. Operating model and resource to be decided February 20, 20, February 2023. Implementation of plans for March 2023. So, I'll repeat that last bit. Implement, implementation of plans for March 2023. Um, which. Do you consider that rolling out the educare strategy for March 2023 is acting at pace and should it be a measure that matters? That, in other words, which, should it be targeted? Um, so, um, so I genuinely believe that's as fast as we can do it at the moment given the um, the, the, the scale and the scope of the activity we're doing. That there's a lot of work going on at the minute uh, currently to uh, reduce the numbers of children coming into our care and to increase the numbers of children returning home from care where that's safe and appropriate. Um, the edge of care strategy will be a longer term um, strategy and plan for that uh, and there's a lot of people working on that at the minute and it needs to be multi-agency not just uh, children's social care services so I think that is a realistic time scale. The fact that so um, there will be a wide range of performance and management information indicators that will be part of the new scorecard uh, going forward. Um, the measures that matter were intended to be, um, if you like, a much smaller group of measures that matter that simply give um, the audience, whether it be this committee or, or, or others, uh, a sense that um, things are moving in the right direction. That, that's not excluding the wider dashboard. So the fact that uh, in order for it to be a measure that matter, we would need to just consider what's the actual measure that you manage out of that. Because that's a, an edge of care strategy will be a wide range of activities. So if you just if if you said, for example, it's about the numbers of children in care or the rate of children in care, then yes, we do that anyway. That's part of the dashboard. So happy to have a conversation with that, the measures that matter because it's something you've shown an interest in uh, on, on occasions in the past. But the fact that it's not one of the measures that matter in this document doesn't mean it has a lower priority. Um, Right, yeah, I would sort of counter that if, that if the top priorities are measures that measures, those are the things you really concentrate on. And I, my argument would be that it's possible to decide on appropriate measure. Um, and then, and um, I would say that preventative family support should be, should be a priority. Um, and by the way, as you probably know, that family group conferences are actually uh, a statutory requirement and I understand that very little are done and also it is by law 
there should be support given to prevent children from being separated from their parents and therefore it is a legal requirement and I think that people would agree that it also should be a party where it's going So the, the edge of care strategy will include um, and does it include currently in terms of family support and that's part of the service you want to extend because it isn't enough of a service at the minute. Um, I'm going to question the point that you make, um, not wanting to get into an argument, but it isn't a statutory requirement that we have family group conferences. It is uh, a requirement that we have family meetings, and we do that through, for example, the pre-proceedings framework and others. It's um, in a number of local authorities, it's certainly a good practice element that you have family group conferences, and which is why we're promoting that at the moment. But it isn't, uh, I'm, I'm open to be challenged in terms of if you can point me to the legislation yeah. that says you have to have a family group conference. Yeah. Family group conference is one model of a type of family meeting. So we, we are certainly need, should have family meetings. Let's not get into that debate. Yeah. I think the but, point what we made... important point because I've heard yeah, yeah, raised it a couple yeah. of times the, 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 and, the, and, the, and the, I haven't challenged the, it in the past. The, yeah. the key point is, and we've made this point in Spooten several times, we've had the conversation, the earlier and the more you can invest in early Absolutely. health, whatever form of early health it is, the more you reduce the costs that we're currently incurring on children in care when they get past the point where early help has been applicable. And it's a paradigm shift that has to be made. And it is a problem because we need to spend money on coping with the present issue. But we've made the point that at some point, if we don't go back to investing in early help, then we're never going to get the trap of spending more and more money. So that is an issue that Cabinet, I think, should be highly looking at and the executive say, how on earth can we spend more on early help to make sure that long term, our actual budget requirement doesn't keep dramatically increasing, but decreases. Yeah. I know it's a it's a conundrum, but we keep putting it off. And that question is just one example of yeah. what we should be asking and emphasising. We do and need to. Sure everybody here today agrees on. Yeah, absolutely. Families do, yeah. need to support early and, and of course, it's like climate change. We keep putting it off, but actually, we do need to do something about it. And that's the point of that question. I just want to make a point here about being passed on about quoting parent care of voice. Apparently, they. Um, don't want us to mention parent care of voice because it, it isn't um, they haven't agreed to what we are what what we're saying about them and they say before we do uh, can we have a word and get consent before we say any more about parent care of voice that was the point they wanted to raise important to put that across since we've raised it thank you uh, right so next we're coming on um, following on from the earlier question Mike you're going to ask a question about safe being safe safe to stay with families. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you say what will the multi-agency edge care offer look like? It is intended to build on family strengths and resources, so children and young people can stay with their families where appropriate. But given the pressures families are under, how soon will this service be up and running? Uh, I think we answered that in the, in the last question in terms of there's a time scale in the um, in the document in terms of we want to have a strategy uh, uh, drafted and underway uh, by the end of January and an extended service in place uh, in March. Um, I can't say right now because the strategy is in development what exactly that will look like, but what we do know, for example, is that we have uh, some good services within our ECHO team, uh, that was pointed out in the inspection, and we want to develop and build on that. Uh, we want to uh, supplement that with an extended family group conference offer. Uh, we want uh, stronger links to voluntary community and faith sector organisations uh, and also to the early help strategy. So um, certainly when we got the detail of that, I'm very happy to bring it back. Thank you. The next question really is related, but very simple question on how we can get early help support. John, you're going to ask that. <coughs> this is question four. Thank you, Chairman. Is the Director of Children's Services minded to better resource early help or is the real prevention work likely to be left to the community to do for free. Um. So uh, minded in terms of my personal view and opinion, I think it should be a combination of both. Uh, I would like to see, um, and I've, I've been on record in the past, uh, so I would like to see some of the resources that come into children's services over time be diverted into early help, um, certainly. Um, so there's an element of uh, targeted early help services that the local authority should provide, uh, and I want to uh, extend and grow that. Uh, there's a significant part of the offer that is available in most local authority areas and counties that actually has to be provided by universal services, so community, voluntary faith, 
schools, health centres, nurseries and the like. Um, I don't believe we've got the right balance here in Herefordshire at all. Uh, I've, I've said that before and I'm quite happy to say it again. So um, that's part of the work that, uh, that Gladys is leading. In fact, Gladys wants to comment uh, possibly in a minute because I'm conscious I'm doing all the talking and you're doing it as well. Um, but um, uh, the, the, in terms of how we engage and develop our early health strategy, that is, I'm conscious you're listening to us patiently, and I hope no, we're no, saying something of interest and value to you. It's hugely interesting. Good, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, we are doing some really exciting work now around how we really focus on engagement with children, families, communities, and the whole sector community faith, voluntary and universal providers to absolutely focus on what families have told us will make a difference to preventing problems escalating and reaching crisis points where statutory services um, become involved. We want to really push as much help, support, targeted um, offers into local areas bespoke to those areas and we know the kinds of things that families want because they've told us we've had loads of consultation and um, so we've got to turn it into actions so our work now is to take the strategy turn it into action plans we want some quick wins early next year so people can see ah we said that and now you're doing it so and Daryl's absolutely right. He wants to be able to take money that's currently being spent on the statutory end um, back out into those communities to fund that early help offer. It's not going to happen overnight, but there has been fantastic interest from communities. Build on the talk community model because we know that works. So take something that's working and extend it, develop it, bespoke it. We're going to go back to those children and families in February half term and say thank you for your fantastic input. Here's what we want to do with it. What do you think? Have we heard it right? Is this going to work? Will it make a difference? Um, and we're going to go back to schools in the new year because we haven't given them enough time um, to be able to influence this and to think about what do we wrap around them that can make it easier to have help and support, not stigmatised, universally available um, to those children and families that need it at the earliest point. So it's a massive drive for us. Um, we're looking at best practice elsewhere. We've been looking at the Wigan deal, how they did it. We've looked at child friendly leads. So what are the components that we can bring to Herefordshire? Um, so it, it's an exciting, tangible, um, hopefully new offer that's part of this plan. Um, and just to say, we know we haven't got there soon enough for all yeah. of you. It's been pretty harrowing listening to your stories because you, you're probably thinking too little, too late. Um, when you get 26 weeks to change. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. Years. So we've got to find a way to stick with families through tough times to, to make the changes that we know need to be made it, to help them. That, it's the fact that you've, you've got dishonest staff, but you yeah. have still not publicly <coughs> made a public example that this is not something that now fits with perhaps of just core new values. Yeah. You have got staff still employed here who accepted lies, submitted official documents into court, yeah? Hit information from your legal team who have a obligation to report to court first and therefore obligations to the judge and the court before the local authority. You know, I think we may have had this point made before, we're anxious to hear your voice but Please let us carry the meeting because we've had lots of opportunities yeah. to give the voice, and I think that's and, and that comment's hard. really been noted. I get it. We it's understand, hard. you know, the yeah. tension, we, we pressure, emotion. Yeah. 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 But please help us to let us get on with our meeting too, as well as listen to what no, you have to say. I respect that. I'm yeah. sorry about that. You. You. I know you're very emotive. I'm passionate and because yeah. I lost my yeah. son We know that, Hannah. Thank you. You've listened to us, and please let us carry on now.
you have done your homework as well now. Thank you. Um, Chairman, I'd just like to thank uh, Gladys and the Director for their answers. Yes. But to point out also that the more resources that could be channeled into early help, the less would be the problems later on. Exactly. There's so much damage being done. And I agree. And I think finding ways around the on pass we already talked about many times and you are doing that. Find them, trying to find ways of the on passes. I know that I know uh, Chairman that the voluntary sector does an enormous amount, but that uh, it was a great shame I thought that things like Shaw Start all things yeah. because they did a marvellous job. Yeah. I remember when I was chairman of the council visiting some of the Shaw Start in mm -hmm. Leicester and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful job they did. Mm -hmm. We've gone away from this early help now we need to get back to it. And we won't have all these problems age 15, 16, 17. Perhaps I think you wanted to ask a question about the very issue, Sam, about collaborating mm. providers of early health support. Yeah, please. So I did have the privilege of being at one of the uh, early health world cafes uh, with us over there, and there is a lot of good uh, in the room, a lot of agencies who uh, are fabulous. Um, I, I just wanted to reiterate the point about the cost of volunteering. Uh, it isn't free. It, yeah. uh, actually quite an expensive thing to do properly. Um, other comments in the room, particularly that uh, family support and early help um, are no longer really considered prevention because there's so much backfilling going on in the system at the moment that they are being taken at a much higher level of service. So there's absolutely a need to look at that capacity. Um, but what was particularly concerning, and I think I'd offer some quick early wins for you, is that three of the services in the room, all fantastic services, I have no idea if they have funding post March. <laughs> and you know, you've got organisations that have invested heavily in training people who are becoming increasingly expert. Um, it, those ones who don't know post March are already only on an annual rolling contract anyway. Um, if you were to ask their trustees, and I know one set but not the other two, they would say they're not properly funded to do the work anyway. Um, we've got to change the relationship with that. Group people. Yeah. We've got to have proper commissioning. And we don't need more strategies, more meetings, more engagement, more consultation. We need capacity in the system. So let's just spend some money on some of those existing services who all know and good, they deliver for years and years. We just do it. Yeah. The green 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 yes. Please. Yeah. Don't need to answer that. Um, so turning this is your question. Mm -hmm. um, so the families that encounter difficulties that lead to the PLO pre-proceedings are facing an adversarial legal system which offers them little support. Um, what provision is being made to provide families with the right information to court proceedings in a timely manner so that they're fully aware of the process and the implications? And I'll just add to that is that the, the communication that families are getting is very poor and uh, I would like to know where that communication is accessible to us on a, a publicly accessible um, for those families because it appears that it's, it's not very clear. Okay. Um, so off the top of my head I don't know whether there's a page on our, on our website on, on pre-proceedings but I'll, I'll, I'll check that whether you, whether you know Tom. I'm not aware of that, what I am aware of, that the, that last year, in 2021, the um, National Public Law Working Group uh, published its final report, and within that report is um, the collective wisdom of many learned people up and down the country about support for families pre-proceedings, and so if when we check there isn't, or even if there is, but it needs to be updated and refreshed, I think we've got a really good source um, in order to bring together um, that best practice. Thank you. Could, could we put that in board as a recommendation that we ensure that that is possible? What wording would you like to put to that, Tony? What wording would you like to put to that? Um, to, well, let, let's, let's check where the um, the PLO pre-proceedings that families are properly advised of the um, right information for PLO pre-proceedings and in a timely manner so that they're fully aware of the process and implications. Can I say advised and supportive because actually sometimes you need advice but you need support to actually do it. Okay, thank you. 
there's a sorry, Theo, there's a follow on to that, I think, um, question two, Tanya. Yeah, okay, so it, it says uh, training on the HRA is does the information exist on a publicly accessible page? And can you direct direct me to it? So are they identified pathways through the service easily found and understood by families? And do we have feedback on that? So that's part of the. Um, uh, so no, there aren't at the minute in terms of uh, if you just went to one page and found those. That's part of the uh, one strand of the work that we're planning to do in that listening to families approach. Actually, is, is sit down and listen to families about what was their experience, have the conversation about what well, this is how we hope that process will work. Uh, and then kind of map that uh, and then um, with families help users to write and produce that material we put that onto our website next year. Okay. So okay. I feel also that means we need to do that at pace because there are families getting caught up in this that actually are at sea and they, have, they do not have that information or the guidance to work with. So and we, we've we started from scratch in terms of the information that's up to date on, on the external website, but yes, I agree with you. Yeah, that's a key point we made about HRA and Qualities Act training, people being aware of how that impacts upon actions that we take. Uh, and I think the word actually says something about being um, empathetic. Uh, there is work to do, and I think if people are trained in understanding the implications of decisions, that can help, like, you know, questions here that we take a bit more time because we have to be aware of the, the increased sensitivity emotions that people have uh, and for people to be trained in how to handle the impacts of their decisions in terms of the HRA and EA should be a priority, we believe. And there isn't enough awareness of it amongst officers and probably members as well for that matter. So, important point. Uh, and before we move on, uh, Dan, uh, as a cabinet member, this whole area is obviously the responsibility of the executive to make sure we are moving up pace, monitoring and measuring everything that's happening. Uh, actually, yeah, it's the executive we're holding to account. Would you like to add some um, extra thoughts yes, on well, these questions? Yeah, it, it's all very interesting. I'm grateful for the work that Gladys is doing, and she's had a lot of conversations. So I'm constantly having conversations with local families in foster care and here. So um, yeah, it's it's all really important, and as far as early help is concerned, I wish we you know I wish we did have the resources to just put into lots of work you know upstream supporting people as soon as they need it. So then it all gets a bit critical. But you know it, it's, it's very frustrating that the resources are lacking. But I'm, as ever, I I you know put out that I'm always have to have conversations with people. And I wish we were supporting the things that. Yeah, this was talking about the inspection. Oh, you had your hand up some time. Thank you. You had your hand up some time ago, David. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, basically, Gladys, uh, we've got, uh, I've been pushing on early health for quite some time, as you know. I know. Perinatal uh, maternity <laughs> health services, how are we dealing with them? Are we getting the information from them? Are they sending uh, mothers or fathers to you that they feel might need help? Is it happening? Because I know they have quite a, they have quite a large, and it's quite a well taken up issue. And I think they've got more money. I'm not sure. So that's NHS funding, of course. So I think it, it is a priority that we really, we have had a little trouble communicating with them as far as, as far as things are concerned. But I think they're getting a little more flexible now. So it would yeah. be interesting to get some feedback on that. One. Yeah. Thank you. I'll get back to you. Okay, thank you, guys. I think that probably was the last question on the uh, last page now. Uh, yeah, the event, so we're at uh, item seven of the list of improvement areas. And the availability to support and service in children and people's needs. Um, you hear stories of that, and I think you were going to ask that question, Jane, weren't you? It doesn't matter, we have to do it. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, so. The, the, the statement was that we still hear the stories of people having to retell their stories. One family's waited every two years for this support. Life story work to be organised and implemented effectively. This means the child is constantly re-traumatised, having to tell her story or his story. And so far, nine social workers. The concern has been shared at every meeting in attendance in 2020. And we've got a number of questions. How does the director intend to correct this deficit? How many social workers are trained in life story work? Completing a partnership exercise to establish the availability of local services and see about CAMs intervening. 
to support the breakdown of children's mental well-being at the front door before Hamlet's at crisis point. Educare will offer additional resources that have been budgeted for, uh, and we've already asked a question about psychologist help, which is an effective use of money. So basically, it's just um, reassurance and the availability of supporting services to meet needs. Um, so, uh, again, we've kind of touched on it a, a couple of times in, in the meeting. At the minute, in a number of areas, including the provision of life story work, they just don't have enough resource at the minute. Uh, and uh, a lot of that is also dependent on our ability to recruit permanent social workers. We'll be in a much better position uh, to be able to provide good, effective uh, life story work and uh, relationships that are stable with children in, in care and new people. And so that's one of the factors where we're going to struggle to make significant progress in a short period of time until our recruitment activity is picking up. Um, we're training more social workers in different parts of the service and life story work. You asked the question about exactly how I many. I don't have that in my head. Okay, but that's some reassuring at least that we are a primary source to that question. There's a detailed question here about allocation of resources, but I'm just saying we can skip it because I don't think we do think it's satisfactory that um, the amount of money that we're spending on agency workers, and you've already mentioned that, and it's a big drive to get permanent staff there. We're so, absolutely c committed to reducing... Yeah, I, I you know, we've, got some, we've got some very good agency workers, uh, yeah. and but also we, but we, we need more permanent workers going forward. So I, I just thought we could move on because I think we've established that in this meeting that scrutiny concerned about it. You have acknowledged that. So, um, so this last question. Sorry, I know, Helen, you had a question to ask, I think, and what we've just been discussing, Helen. Yeah, yes. So I just raise this. Um, there was a leaflet who can make decisions about me leaflet, which I did illustrations for in April 21 with the Children's Social Work Manager children and young people in care team. Um, I did the illustrations, set them off, and I think nothing's ever happened about this leaflet. Can I just... Are you aware of, uh, of it? Uh, I'm aware because you mentioned it to me recently, but I don't know, I haven't, uh, I don't know where, what, where it's at or where it got to. I will inquire and come back to you on that. It's a leaflet that children should have, because it's... Yeah, you mentioned it to me recently, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of questions on area 10, which is send. And Sam, you asked a particular question about that. Uh, if you'd like to ask this question while I'm debating. Yeah, okay. although you may wish to refer to the uh, answer you gave to Melissa, because it's a similar question. Um, essentially, there is a lack of confidence amongst head teachers uh, with regard to send. Uh, there's a critical concern about capacity, lack of availability of spaces in um, special settings. Children are actually being excluded from schools, mainstream education, because of the lack of provision. Um, there's huge pressure on staffing levels within the team, which means excellent staff are overloaded and we're only one social inclusion officer in the whole of Herefordshire. Um, in a sense, all it says in here is that we're going to reconsider our strategy. Uh, we're going to have a look at some protocols again. Uh, how are we addressing the deficit in this provision? We, we must, we, you, you've done the peer review, you've got the data. Specifically, it would be really nice to know something is happening so that we can reassure our heads and others in the system. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm going to struggle to do this one just this, uh, in, in a minute or two, but uh, what we can probably do is bring you a detailed um, progress and update report at the next scrutiny committee. So, for example, on the back of the peer review, um, we have uh, challenged and worked with uh, our partners in health agencies to put more capacity in. There's too many children waiting too long for an assessment, which means that some children are starting school without a, an assessment of their need completed. So we're doing quite a lot of work uh, there. Uh, we've put extra capacity into our SEND team in the last couple of months, um, and we're very much talking to and listening to um, those same head teachers that you've been talking to really about how we work differently with them going forward. Yeah. So I think, uh, if, with the chair's permission, we'd prefer to kind of bring a more of a, a detailed report in the new year if we can. Well, we are going to scrutinise it in it's on, it's on the forward work plan, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But given that it's part of the improvement plan, it's good yeah. to ask a couple of big questions. Can you've got one question to ask on that channel on the SEND aspect yeah. of the improvement um, plan. Um, basically, so users report that CAMS is unable to deal with the mental. Um, well-being crisis that has emerged following the lockdowns and that social care referrals are being made in favour of mental health referrals. Is this because the service is unable to cope with the mental health needs of the children and are they using multi-agency referral forms? 
re referring children to children's services to reduce caseloads that they are unable to deal with. Um, so that's one part of the question. And, and then secondly, you know, what is the consequence of a multi-agency referral form for families who are seeking help through CARES? And uh, what, what is the correlation between initial referrals to CAMS and pathways to the local authority? And do you know? Do we have information on how many of those girls are suggesting um, fabricated induced illness as underlying causes of mental health distress in young people? Can I just advise that we've now moved on to yeah. the Herefordshire Safeguarding Children's Fund? We've pretty well answered all, asked all the questions. And I was just going to say the same thing. That's the first question of the, because they are cross-related. So just going back, we, had, we asked the last question on the improvement plan. We had all the questions that we wanted to ask, and we tried to prioritise as, as we've been going along. And we had a, two to recommendations to make, so we just complete that. You've asked the first question of that, and they are cross-related, so we'll just come back to that afterwards. But <coughs> we had a really deep discussion on the improvement plan, I hope you agree. And I'm mindful that we're taking a lot of time, but because we've had so few scrutiny meetings for various reasons this year, we're trying to cram and but also do effectively a number of reports. So hope you bear with us in taking time. So I know we're coming to the end of our three hours. Is everybody agreeable to work on until 5.30? And we will keep highlight some key questions on the safeguarding partnership and cut out some of the questions to make sure we cover it, but cover the key questions. Is everybody happy to carry on to 5.30? And we complete the third element of the, the work? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, so could someone propose that we accept the improvement plan and second it and note the recommendations that we have made? Uh, Jane, do you want to be clear about the recommendations? Read the recommendations. Yes, you do, yeah. Well, I've got, yes, I've got four. Um, one is that trauma training should be recommended as a priority. For whom? For whom? For everybody, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> everybody that needs it, members, officers, uh, uh, social workers, legal. So everybody needs to have greater. And it, David, you come in a very appropriate time because these are recommendations to the executive. Uh, the second one that um, Sam did a, quite a paper on feedback from a primary teacher, uh, which I think coming from the field would be really useful to share. It's a number of comments which we didn't discuss in detail, but we would really be useful to share that with you, to inform you on somebody from the field and what they think about important elements of it. That um, we should implement HRA and LEA training at pace so people yeah. understand how yeah. AA, what did I say? Yeah. Yeah. You said AA. E yeah. <laughs> Training, uh, it's getting late in the day, sorry. Is, yeah. um, at pace as well, because it's important to understand how the implications of those acts in relation to being apathetic, but the implications of decisions taken would help people such as in legal to better understand when they're making decisions how that impacts upon people. And the third one was check where the PLO pre proceedings advice and support is given in a timely manner. Is that is that some of that recommendation? Didn't quite get all the detail to me. Michael, you got it. Great. Yeah, so what, what I've got is that families are properly advised on the right information or advice and support on public or health on the PLO pre court proceedings. Thank you. Also, Chair, that, that I've, I've noted a specific uh, issue which was raised by member in relation to the target dates um, to develop a family free conference model um, that if we targeted for April 2023 rather than ASAP thereafter as currently said. Is that a fifth recommendation you're saying? I think it links to what we have read up to in last stage seven. I think it links to what we were reading on the family free conference. Okay. Right. But there was a specific date or oh, you said you wouldn't necessarily be into family group conferences, but something similar. I'm keen and, and committed to introducing family group conferences. The issue yeah. is about whether there are a uh, statute or not. Yeah. We're all agreed we want to introduce family group conferences. Yeah, 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 okay. And that in April time scale to bring it to pace, as we yes. say, would yeah. be something that should be yes. implemented. Okay. So I've got those five recommendations then. Um, can we just make a suggestion? There is an organisation called the Family Rights Group, yeah. and if there was a link from the appropriate page of the council web 
pay to the spelling bees grow because they don't, in my opinion, they don't even, they don't need to have the information, the correct information about their rights, etc. when it's about to get into court. They need it actually further on. Yeah. And it will actually save the council money because instead of unnecessary care proceedings being started, then, you know, if people actually know their rights and, you know, and insist on their rights, it could save money. So could perhaps the recommendation be extended with Darrell's agreement? Yep, we'd be happy to. Yeah, uh, the, the, the family, family rights group is an organisation we're talking to at the minute, and um, and there are a couple of other organisations that provide uh, good advice to families that we that we do want to link to on our website. Okay. Provide, so, so yeah, happy to take that on board. Yes, yeah, sorry. What the screen officer is saying to me, we should say all those recommendations should be submitted in action plan to the executive for consideration of cabinet on Thursday. I think there's a request that the um, recommendations be read out. Would you yeah. mind? Again, I think sort of if it would assist, I can know what I've got there. The committee yeah. can. Yes. Is that what it says? Yeah. All right. You've got a, you, yeah, you noted them as we get a lot of these. All right, cool. Yes. So I've got five, I believe. Right, so yeah. I find my read out chair what I've got yeah. and then see if there's anything to yeah. from that. Please do. That's all right. So what I've noted is what, what members have proposed during the proceedings is that the following recommendations be made to Cabinet for inclusion in the Children's Services Improvement Action Plan. That trauma awareness training for relevant children and young people services officers and trauma awareness practice be introduced into the Children Serve Children and Young People's Improvement Action Plan and into practice. That the targeted action to develop and launch a family group conference model be targeted for April 2023 rather than ASAP thereafter, as currently stated, that families are properly advised on the right information and advice and support on public or outline PRO pre-court proceedings. PLO. PLO. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, with a link, that, you need to put with a link to the... Family rights group. Yeah. There's a link to the family rights group. Family rights group, yeah. And other resources. And other resources. And there were two others. One was to share the primary teacher feedback that is provided by. Yes, Jen. So that Some, isn't part of the wooden plan, but no, it's no, an action. It's an action to share. Yeah. And the other was to implement HRA and E training at pace as well. Right. To implement. So okay. the first recommendation was that trauma awareness training should be there for the whole council, mm -hmm. yep. not just for the director, no, which is what... Said. Oh, I thought yeah. you said that just the director. Sorry, no, 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 you said members, officers and, and relevant. And other relevant people, wasn't it? You said anybody that would be affected should be trained, the whole council effectively. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Is everybody clear what those recommendations are? Are we happy with those? Yeah. We, is there any burning issue that members feel we've left out? Some of those we accept that report with those five recommendations to pass on to Cabinet. Yes. Thank you. Um, That's with a slight finesse that all the social workers should tell tell their clients that the family group or put it into writing to them. Obviously not I mean, at an appropriate stage, I mean yeah. not just the first time they meet them, yeah. but I'm sure that'll come about when we implement the whatever it is, we're going to be in family group conferences. Actually, tell us what the universal services are, and then actually, yeah. when you find out what universal well, services are, thank you. I think that's the point. Um, they don't support us, then you find a solution rather than just going crack on. That's the point you're making, I think, isn't it, uh, Fiona? Yeah. I'm trying to make that. If um, if there's any doubt that care proceedings may be commenced or whatever, then people are verbally and or in writing. So the social workers signpost at the appropriate time. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. and specifically, I would, I would like to say that. So part of the recommendation to ensure that social workers sign post at the appropriate time. Yeah, okay, we've done that. Yeah. 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 Okay, we've got a, I'll propose you're a seconder. All those in favour? Anyone? No, that's unanimous. Thank you. I hope that's clear. We'll, we'll, we'll tidy up the details. I think we're all pretty clear what we need to do. Right, so we're looking now at um, item nine on the agenda, which is the Health and Safeguard in Children Partnership annual report. We are obliged to look at this annually and we haven't looked at it for some time. 
So we ready, I mean, we've got a number of questions, but we will pick out some key ones that we believe are relevant. Uh, David, I hope that last report gives you some um, guidance on what we're going to be saying to you for the coming meeting on Thursday. Just to go back to the results. Is there anything you want to add before I move on? Sorry, I was about to give you the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Well, but we haven't got a meeting to defer. No, we haven't, no. So we're going to pick out just a few key questions. We're not going to be all the specific, but it's something to go into. And we've agreed we're going to extend by half an hour, okay? So we're just going to pick out one or two key questions. Otherwise, the one we've done for next year, because we've already agreed that we have one time another meeting to do it. Although you are disadvantaged with the fact that the, the technology has failed, so you've got the independent yeah. scrutineer mm. uh, and, yeah. and the chief yeah, nursing yeah. officer well, that is joining us remotely. Yeah. I'm very pleased that um, I think he's uh, essential to the Roberts is here as one of the other exactly. statute partners. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. we're going to join me for this item, mm. but that's fact. You haven't got the other partners or the independent scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. There are there two people said yeah. online who I think can hear as to whether they can actually respond. Well, yeah. I don't know even tested We haven't got the yet. independent scrutiny here, who's pretty essential to answer some of the questions. Um, we probably can't do that to the next meeting. February. February the 14th, and we've already got as busy a programme as this. Right, okay. Yes, I can try and do it from the so you don't have to be a design so you can defer. There's not a there's not a requirement that it's, it's received within a certain timeline. Um, but obviously, it's preferable that it is received. Yeah. Um, the the report for the period up to thirty first of March next year is likely to be ready uh, in September. Catherine yeah. Capet. You, you can send your piece in February if you wanted it. Add it onto his agenda or the June agenda. But oh, I mean, well, I just have to show my laptop to the great to change of Herefordshire. Children Safeguard in partnership, and um, I think it's quite critical that we, we add our input. But then, but then I think we need to ask our members. So, should we just go round and see what people think? What do you think? Just the stone. I think it would be wise to defer it without all the um, essential people here. Okay. I think there will be time for the next meeting. I also feel it's better to discuss it properly at the next meeting rather than to rush through with everybody wants to get home by this time, as we've been going on for three hours. Yes. So. Yeah, listening for the all the advice and information, I think we should defer it. Yes. Uh, we can't. We might be able to get somebody on here, but we wouldn't hear them very well, and it wouldn't give us time to effectively scrutinise it. I think, given the experience of today and the last meeting, we, we tried to get a lot in because we've missed a number of scrutiny meetings. We've already got a very full meeting for February. I, t I think your suggestion we should put that in the June agenda for the next screening committee is probably the right way to go back. I think that's too late for us. Oh, well, I think it's too late to refer to yourselves yeah. and, yeah. and the Democratic yeah. Services team in terms of the formal yeah. work. I'm quite keen not to make sure we have agendas we can't get through. There's no point in doing that. Um, can you hear from the rest of the members? Well, we've had two people say already. Would you agree we should defer it until a subsequent meeting to be decided, given what we just heard? We don't have the independent scrutiny to give us advice and answer the questions we want to ask. Well, actually, I un understand what everybody's saying. I, I do have real concern that it, we will not be able to cover it in the next meeting. We won't in the next meeting. As well, and, and uh, then, so that means that actually we. If, if she's the right person, I, I can just turn the sound right up. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, um, so, so I, you know, part of me feels that potentially we could ask the questions and we could ask for uh, brief responses um, from. Well, we could email them. Yeah. yeah or yeah. Uh, sorry. I okay. Uh, Does that be satisfactory to everybody to make sure we do actually put the questions down? Yeah, if I, you might, yeah, I just want to bring it to your attention yeah. that the, the, the witnesses are online on zoom and there's a possible technical uh, solution if you want to consider it so right. i'll just bring that to your attention so you know so is that kevin can kevin you hear Compton. us kevin kevin can you hear yes i can hear you oh great good so we have got you right yes so, indeed you have yeah you most of that conversation I did, and and I think it is a report that that is uh, warrants quite some detailed discussion, as you've mentioned. And um, if you were to defer to a later meeting, um, uh, it would give certainly me an opportunity to come to you and to report how, how I think the partnership is developing. 
if you look, one of the main themes of this this report is the identification of a lot of things that need to change, yeah. and the partnership is trying to change a number of those things. Um, but uh, I think, as, as Daryl has eloquently said earlier, some of these things do take a little bit of time. Um, so, so deferring in that way, I mean, from my, my point of view, that's very helpful because I'm new, new to the role here. and I could probably tell you a lot more if there was deferment. I, yep. would have a, I would have a slight problem with your February meeting, Chair. I'm going to be very honest, as I'm going to be in Australia um, in a long planned yeah. visit. <laughs> okay, I think the way around this, this situation is we did discuss early on when we, we became Chair and Vice Chair and discussed with Claire Ward, who was the solicitor at the time. And there are about 10 reports that we should be scrutinising. And it's clearly impossible to do those at meetings and do other scrutiny as well. And we agreed that we should be developing a model where we receive the reports between the committee and formally we worked out what the questions were, fed them back to the author of the reports and then produced that as a report to a subsequent meeting without effectively asking the questions. But there would be a report because most of the reports are to be noted. Um, we haven't done that. We weren't looking at the reports at all. And that had gone on for several years, so we made the suggestion that that is a way we could operate. So we received them and we could ask any key questions, but basically we had actually had the reports. And I suggest we should do that here. We've got um, about 10 questions we wanted to ask, quite searching ones. We could send you those and presumably you could answer those and we could submit that as a report to the next meeting. So at least we'd had it and scrutiny members had a chance to see it. And if there were two or three really good questions we needed to come back on, we could do that without it taking a lot of time in the meeting and we could probably cover it. Right. To my mind, I think that's probably the best way of doing it. Were you going to say something, Michael? No. Oh, were you pointing to saying something? No, 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 I was just nodding at people to check yeah. whether there was yeah. some agreement in the room about that suggestion. Can I ask members what you feel about that? I don't think we're going to do it adequately in the time. No. That is a model we've already discussed. We haven't implemented it. It's in our assessment of scrutiny that there are a number of reports and that's the way they should be handled. And I think this is and a case in point. We can handle the report that way. You will still get to see the answer to the questions, um, but you, we won't we'll ask all of them. Back. We'll bring them back. If there are any two or three questions that haven't been answered in the feedback from you, Kevin, which you've agreed you can do for us, then yes, we'll okay. supplementary. David. Yeah, I'm just like on previous safeguarding issues we've had in children's, it's a big, it's, there's a lot of scope yeah. and there's a lot of, um, and like, lots of nice stuff in it which we need to look at. Yeah. I think we need time to take it in because it is a difficult subject. Yes. I don't think we should be running past it, so I would okay. be very happy to see it postponed. Now, I'm not on the committee, I know, yeah. but yeah. I have a I have you, you are today, you're a substitute. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, I, I think I can't really take, probably contribute if you don't mind, it's up to members to decide yeah. about what yeah. we do. Had you done it here, we'd have heard the questions, so would yeah. you share the questions? Uh, we, yeah, I have got time to do that. I'm going to propose that we submit the question to the independent scrutiny over the well, they, recommendation the and he, he submits answer to all our questions in a report which we receive for the next meeting uh, and if there are any supplementaries we can ask them then, but we, the main set of questions we ask the independent scrutiny to give us back in the report to be submitted at the next meeting. I propose that. We'll send you to second that we do that. Yes, thank you, Councillor. All those in favour? Right, that's carried. That's what we'll do. And are you, you understand that, Kevin, and you're happy to do that for us? Yes, Chair, I'll endeavour to do that. I'll talk with the partnership, because the answers may, may not necessarily just come from me, they'll come from the partners. I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I'm watching them doing what they're doing and taking a view, so they'll probably be uh, as I say, partners may wish to answer the questions too, Chair, and that'll be helpful. Okay, thank you very we much can, and thank you for your work. We can discuss this at the partnership board that meets later this week. Thanks for waiting. Sir. Thanks for attending and sorry we couldn't get you up before. No, it's fine. It's been very interesting listening to the meeting. Thank you, Chair. And we got you now. We've made a good decision. Thank you. Thanks. But let's move on to item 10, which is an update progress report, which you were going to introduce to us, Michael. Uh, certainly, Chair. Just as a very brief item, it's an information report to the committee on information accepted by the committee and recommendations made. Uh, you'll find the appendices uh, update on the information requests. Uh, I've got a couple of updates further to that. Um, there's a request for the uh, list register um, and a copy <coughs> of the, the children's you know, the list register is revised 
uh, and update it quarterly with a revised version at the end of each quarter. Uh, so this will be available uh, for members of the committee mid-January 2023 and for inclusion in the papers with the progress report for the 14th of February 2023 meeting. Uh, also on the request for a workforce <coughs> profile by Herefordshire, a workforce profile is being produced by the Children and Young People Research Service and will be available in February 2023 and should be available for inclusion in the progress report for the meeting on 14th February 2023. So those are the needs of additional updates. Yeah, thank you. We've been working very hard to make sure we do the essential scrutiny no risks and meetings and also we've been working with the DCS on what reports are going to be available by when to make sure that when we do scrutinise the reports actually have been produced and been signed off so we're scrutinising effectively. So the January date which currently is shown is it won't be January, it'll be the 14th of February. We were originally going to look at send in January but given there are a number of reports to look at and they won't all have to be completed by then. It makes more sense to do it in February, and that should still be in time to look at several areas of SEND, and in particular also whether we feel we're ready for an expected offset inspection sometime after that. So that's why we've said that's a priority for the February meeting. That will be the last meeting in this current municipal year because of PERDA. We would have hoped to have had at least one more meeting, but that isn't likely to be able to happen. So in order to make sure the next the committee, whoever it's composed of, whether we're all re-elected and do it again or new, there are two things we're doing. We're proposing, without actual specific data at this moment, putting the agendas together for the June and August meetings, in conjunction with yourself, Carol, of what reports and what information are available for us to produce effective scrutiny, to suggest an agenda, and dates are obviously to put in the diary well before that time. So we give the next committee a work program to start with for two meetings. And we feel a good legacy for this committee since we can't hold any other meeting than the one in February. That in the original assessment we did, which we all shared about actually not being very fit for purpose as a scrutiny committee, and that a key reason for that was every year new councils join us, certainly every time we get new elections who have no idea what scrutiny is about and starting from scratch with acronyms and everything else that's going on that we recommended there should be a portal set up an information and training portal the work that we do so that new members can be much more effectively trained up to all the things that we've done all the acronyms all the understanding much more quickly than previous committee members have done so we implemented the workshops for example which i think we all agree helped us enormously in being confident about asking questions. So what we'd like to say as a legacy for this committee is that a fully effective scrutiny, and in our case, children's scrutiny portal is set up with training on their information there, reading divided amongst essential reading and reading that would be preferred so that new members can feel confident within a short period of time that they are up to steam to be able to perform effectively in scrutiny. And um, if we can't have more meetings, we'd like that to be a commitment that that will be in place, ready for the new committee in the new new separate year. Does that sum up the discussion we've had pretty well? Yes, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can we have that commitment from the David as leader or well, the current who one? Knows, who knows <laughs> going to be the leader next year? <laughs> no, but you will be in the, no, no, but you are in the year we want this to be up in place. Yes. You, we will all be up for election, but we want that in place before the election happens, so we know it's going to be ready for the new scrutiny. Yeah, yeah. So we yeah, will have to work with democratic services if they. We think it's work. feasible to do. Okay. So we we can, make, we can make that as a recommendation. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So a recommendation on progress to the executive that a scrutiny portal is set up mm -hmm. in order that new members of scrutiny can be updated and be informed to conduct scrutiny effectively in place before the end of this municipal year a recommendation to cabinet that, that is put in place i'll propose that with somebody second it thank you tony all those in favor that's unanimous i think that's pretty clear what they're going to do and i think that ends the meeting yeah, sorry, work plan. Well, oh, well, I, we've sort of discussed that. We just looked at it, I think, and said what we're going to do.
There are change dates in the previously agreed date. So we need to get everybody to agree with what we just said. So, okay. Well, we've outlined what the work program is going to be. Uh, I thought formality we should get committed to agree that that is an acceptable work plan. Uh, I'll propose that that is the work plan. Somebody like to second that? Thank you, Councillor Fagan. All those in favour? Right. Does that satisfy proper protocol? Sufficiently. Thank you. Um, I understand that the Mountain Independent Reviewing Officers is going to be on the agenda for the February meeting. Is that the case? It is correct, yeah. And I suggest that. An external witness is a representative of the independent reviewing officers, and because uh, I can explain why I think it, do you okay. think that would be an idea to have yep. a staff representative of the independent reviewing officer yep. to say whether they think things are going well, yep. whether they can be improved? I'm sure that our clerks noted that as a action to add to the work plan. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else got any points to make on work program planning progress? Well, we finished inside the 5.30. It's been a long full meeting. I think all our brains have been well and truly taxed, but hope you all agree we've had really useful content and feedback for Cabinet on Thursday to provide to you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for public for attending and being patient with us.